Check Thank one, you. two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five. Check, check, check. <laughs>
Office's bu Budget and Economic Outlook. I want to welcome our witness today, the Director of the Congressional Budget Office, Dr. Philip Swagel. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your schedule to be with us today. Um, I will now yield myself five minutes for my opening statement. Uh, good morning once again. And once again, welcome to Dr. Swagel, who is testifying before our committee for the first time as the Director of the Congressional Budget Office. I would also like to take a moment to thank Director Swagel and all the dedicated staff at CBO for their hard work and their commitment to being a nonpartisan, indispensable partner to Congress. In 2019 alone, CBO worked diligently to publish more than 700 cost estimates and nearly 80 analytic reports, working papers, and testimonies. While the compendium of CBO's work is invaluable to our work here in Congress, our annual hearing on the budget and economic outlook is always enlightening as we begin a new session of Congress. Yesterday, CBO released its report, unveiling its projections for the next decade. Unfortunately, the report once again confirms that despite the economic expansion he inherited, the fiscal outlook has worsened since President Trump took office. Uh, Director Swagel, you project a deficit this year that is more than $1 trillion, and over the next day, decade, deficits are projected to rise. The national debt is expected to reach 98% of GDP by 2030, the highest ratio since World War II. Under President Trump, deficits have, have risen to heights not usually seen outside of recessions and major world wars. They have increased every year, an unusual trend given that deficits tend to fall with the unemployment rate. In fact, the deficit in 2019 was the highest since 2012, when we were recovering from the Great Recession and the, and the unemployment rate was 8%, more than double the rate today. As a result of these deficits, the national debt has climbed higher and faster than CBO projected at the end of the Obama administration. Now, on their face, these fiscal facts might not be so concerning if we were using whatever fiscal space we have to make critical investments while interest rates are low, to address the multitude of deficits we face in the real economy. Crumbling infrastructure, skyrocketing health care costs, widening student achievement gaps, a warming climate, lower life expectancy. In light of these and other problems, it's difficult to escape the conclusion that we should be making bolder investments in American families and our nation's future. But unfortunately, that's not the reality. The reality is that President Trump drove up deficits to instead gift the wealthy and corporations with a $1.9 trillion tax cut. At least we thought it would be only $1.9 trillion. As we will learn today, it's substantially more than that. But that's $1.9 trillion that had little meaningful impact on the economy, $1.9 trillion that could have been but was not put toward making childcare more affordable, a college education more accessible, and retirement security more achievable for American families. Our economy and budget face difficult times ahead. An aging population and rising health care costs mean economic growth is projected to be slower and deficits are expected to be larger going forward. As we learned from our previous hearing, a warming climate will increasingly stress our nation's budget. Meanwhile, we will need to make investments in our infrastructure, education, and job training if we hope to compete in the global economy. CBO's report shows that there is a real need to address our fiscal issues over the next several decades, and the solution will require a balanced approach and a fair tax system. As chairman of the committee, I have stressed that we need to think seriously about severe and persistent deficits in the real economy, not just deficits in the budget. That doesn't mean that we can spend tax dollars without thought or discretion, but it does require that we use our nation's resources more wisely than this administration has. It means prioritizing policies that will help modernize our economy, prepare our communities for the opportunities of the future, and help more American families get ahead in this economy. Director Swagall, thank you for being here once again, and I uh, look forward to hearing your testimony. I now yield five minutes to the ranking member for his opening statement. I thank the chairman. Uh, for holding this hearing. Uh, Director Swagel, thank you for your service, and uh, we look forward to your testimony here today. I sure hope the country is paying attention to what's going to be discussed here today. As we're all aware, yesterday the CBO released its annual baseline, confirming, confirming what we already know. Our country is on, a, on an unsustainable fiscal trajectory. Specifically, 
In fiscal 20, CBO expects the deficit will be a trillion plus dollars, an increase of 31 billion from last year. It should be deeply unsettling to all of us here in this room that fiscal year 20 will be the first year since fiscal 12 that the deficit will eclipse a trillion. We're clearly headed in the wrong direction. Looking even further ahead, if we don't take action to get our fiscal house in order, the deficit will be a trillion dollars by fiscal year 21, then rise to 1.7 plus trillion by fiscal 2030. Deficits will total 13 plus trillion over the budget window. This is unacceptable for this country. Our country's unsustainable deficits are driven by our out of control, largely by out of control mandatory spending, which includes daunting interest payments on our debt, even at low rates. Mandatory spending currently accounts for about 70% of the federal budget, and by the end of the budget window, 76%. To put this in perspective, in the mid-1960s, just over a half century ago, spending in the mandatory columns accounted for just 34%. Because of the continued growth of our country's mandatory spending, federal spending will consume an ever-expanding share of economic resources. It will rise from 21% of GDP this year to 23.5% by 2030, vastly exceeding the 20.4% annual average of the past 50 years. Make no mistake, if we continue down this reckless path, CBO confirms that we will face the severe threat of a fiscal crisis which will negatively impact every single American. While Washington undoubtedly has a spending problem, our revenue growth remains pretty strong. CBO estimates federal revenue in fiscal 2020 will increase by $170 billion from the previous year. That's a record, reaching $3.6 trillion. Revenue is projected to grow to $5.7 trillion in fiscal 2030. You ought to be able to run a country on that kind of money. To further underscore this remarkable growth, by fiscal 26, revenues will exceed the historic average for revenues as a percentage of GDP. This upward trend continues through the end of the budget window, it's pretty clear that the government has a spending problem, not a revenue problem. While it's true that we're experiencing a period of historic economic prosperity and growth, the stark reality is that the consequences of our high and rising debt are severe. According to CBO's projections, the federal debt will grow faster than the economy in perpetuity, which of course is unsustainable. And this isn't just CBO's analysis. A few short months ago, right here in this very room, Federal Reserve Chairman Jay Powell testified before this committee, and he said our debt is growing faster than our economy by a margin. By definition, that is unsustainable. There's no way around it. Either Congress will put the federal budget on a sustainable course, or a financial crisis will result. According to CBO, the current death path, a debt path increases the risk of a fiscal crisis, that is, a situation in which the interest rate on federal debt rises abruptly because investors have lost confidence in our U.S. government's fiscal position. We've heard about the reality of our fiscal trajectory time and time again, and yet it still seems as though my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are not taking those warnings seriously. Policies promoted by congressional Democrats would increase mandatory spending by tens of trillions of dollars, thus drastically adding to the national debt. The most notable unrealistic policy proposals that come to mind include Medicare for All and the Green New Deal. It is critical that Congress come together to address our daunting fiscal outlook, and yet Democrats continue to promote outrageously expensive policies with no way to pay for them. Our dire fiscal situation underscores the pressing importance of budget resolutions, which are supposed to come from this committee as a long-term financial plan for the country. Under Democrat control, our committee did not put a budget forward last year, and it doesn't appear as though we'll do one this year. In every business, every city, every state, a, a budget, a budget is done. Yet in the greatest country in the history of the world, we're not doing a budget. It is my hope that after hearing from CBO Director Swagel today, eyes will be open to the stark reality we face. We simply must start making tough budgetary decisions in order to put our country on a responsible fiscal path and deliver on our duty to the American people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back my time. Uh, thank you for your opening statement. In the interest of time, if any other members have opening statements, you may submit those statements in writing for the record. <clears throat>
And now it's my great honor to introduce once again Director Philip Swagel of CBO. Director Swagel, the floor is yours. You are recognized for five minutes, and I will be very liberal with the gavel. So take what time you need. <laughs> Many thanks, uh, Chairman Yarmouth and Ranking Member Womack. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to testify on CBO's budget and e economic update. And thank you, thank you both for your guidance and support during these uh, first seven months uh, as director. And, and thank you to your staff as well um, for, for helping make sure that we're focused on supporting the Congress and the priorities of the, of the Congress. Um, uh, so I'll start with an overview of our um, analysis of the, the budget and the economy. Uh, we project economic growth and job creation will continue over the coming decade, but also a worrisome trajectory for the federal budget. Not since World War II has the country seen deficits during times of low unemployment that are as large as those that we project. Nor in the past century has the United States experienced large deficits for as long as we project. So let me start with the good news on the economy. We project real GDP will expand at a solid 2.2% uh, this year, driving continued job creation and a historically low unemployment rate. We anticipate that consumer spending, spurred by rising wages and household wealth, will remain strong. We also expect business investment to rebound as several of the factors that weighed on businesses last year abate. So in our projections for the later years of the coming decade, GDP growth moderates uh, and settles back to its maximum sustainable growth rate that we see as 1.7%. Now that growth rate is lower than the historical average because of long-term demographic trends. The United States is, a, is an aging society, and that means the growth of our labor uh, force will be slower uh, in the future than it has been in the past. Okay? Now let me turn now to the challenging fiscal situation. In our projections, the federal budget deficit is $1 trillion this year and averages $1.3 trillion per year between 2021 and 2030. The deficit widens from 4.6% of GDP in 2020 out to 5.4% in 2030. Now, over the past 50 years, the average annual deficit equaled 3% of GDP and was generally much lower when the economy was strong. Now, revenues are growing. If current laws did not change, which is the basis of our projection, federal revenues would rise from 16.4% of GDP in 2020 to 18% in 2030, and those projections reflect a scheduled increase in individual income taxes at the end of 2025, among other changes that are in current law. The, the challenge is that spending is projected to grow more than revenues, widening the gap between spending and revenues. In our projection, uh, federal outlays climb from 21% of GDP to 23.4% of GDP over the, ne the next decade, and th that growth in, in outlays reflects mainly increased spending for mandatory programs, and then also increased payments of interest on the federal debt. So the increase in mandatory outlays over the decade is from 12.9% of GDP to 15.2% of GDP. And again, that's attributable to the long-term demographic uh, trend. It's to the aging of the population. A second factor is rising healthcare costs. You'll, you'll, you'll see in our report, we have healthcare costs rising more slowly than has been the case in the past, but still rising faster than overall GDP. So um, those two trends, uh, aging and healthcare costs, affect Social Security and Medicare uh, in particular. And we see those trends persisting beyond the 10-year budget horizon. Um, the, the increase in interest spending in net interest outlays over, um, the, uh, over our baseline, it's caused by, by both large deficits and also what we see as rising interest rates uh, over the, the 10 years and, and beyond after a period in which interest rates have been uh, very low. Um, the result of all this is that federal debt held by the public will rise from $31.4 trillion at the end of 2020. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, federal debt held by the public will rise to $31.4 trillion at the end of 2030, and that's an amount equal to 98% of GDP. Now, at that point, in 2030, debt would be higher as a percentage of GDP than at any point since just after World War II, and the debt will be more than double what it has averaged over the past 50 years. We project that, the, again, the gap between spending and revenue will continue to widen, and that eventually the debt, uh, in our long-term uh, projection 30 years hence, would reach 180% of GDP by 2050, and that's well above the highest percentage ever recorded in the United States. And, and it would be headed higher uh, after that. So that, that debt path would dampen economic uh, output in the US. 
It would increase our interest payments to foreigners since we, bought, uh, we borrow from uh, foreigners. It would also elevate the risk of, of negative economic effects, whether slow moving or sudden, such as a, a fiscal crisis. Now, to be sure, interest rates remain low today. There's time to address our fiscal challenges, and fiscal policy could be used as a tool to address other challenges facing the nation if the Congress chooses to do so. But our, our debt is on an unsustainable path, and over time, we must address uh, this fiscal challenge. So to conclude, the US economy is doing well with low unemployment and rising wages that have drawn people off the sidelines and back into the labor force. But the economy's performance makes the large and growing deficit all the more noteworthy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, we will now begin our question and answer session. As a reminder, members can submit written questions to be answered later in writing. Those questions <laughs> and the witnesses' answers will be made part of the formal hearing record. Any members who wish to submit questions for the record may do so within seven days. Uh, as we usually do, the ranking member and I will defer our questions until the end. So I now recognize uh, Mr. Higgins of New York for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just, a couple of things. I, since 2003, when the United States went in to uh, invade and occupy Iraq, at that time, the United States economy was eight and a half times larger than that of China. Today, China's economy is, in some measures, larger than the United States. And the difference is that the United States, in some estimates, spent $1.9 trillion in Iraq. That's $6,300 per person with a population of 327 million people. China, on the other hand, invested in the growth of their own economy, which catapulted them to a point where the Chinese economy grew by about 8.5%. Each year since 2003, the United States economy, I was just kind of adding it up, I didn't quite get there, but we're hovering about maybe 2 to 2.4%. You know, we had a tax cut bill that was approved in December of 2017. And the White House Council of Economic Advisors uh, issued a report. And they said that each American household would realize an annual increase in household income because of this tax cut of between four and $9,000. Is there any evidence that that has actually occurred? Uh, um, we haven't tallied the dollars per household. Um, we, we did a comprehensive analysis in April 2018. Is there any evidence that it's close? Um, uh, the tax cut has raised GDP, and so we see the level of GDP is about 1% higher, but we haven't apportioned that. What's uh, the GDP household. growth right now? Uh, we, well, we see uh, GDP growth uh, coming in this year at about 2.4% well, 2 so last two year and 2.2% Okay, 2.4%. So what you're saying is it would have been 1.4% without the tax cut? Uh, the, we see that the level of GDP is higher. The growth rate impact is maybe two, to, two or three tenths of a percent uh, per year. Well, that's different from 1%. So the level of GDP is higher. Okay, the I'm, incomes are higher, but the growth rate is... Uh, okay, I'm confused. All right. Yeah, I'm, I apologize. All right, but, but we were also told that we would expect to try to achieve annual economic growth because of this tax cut bill by 4% annually. Is there any evidence that we're close to that or within the foreseeable future can achieve that? So we don't see that happening. In our projection, GDP growth goes down. I just say our GDP projection is well within the range of, of yeah. other forecasters. Yeah. The, the blue chip uh, economic forecast surveys 40 or 50 leading economic forecasters, yeah. and none see growth rising above 2.5%. OK, so, so the 4% annual economic growth is not achievable within the foreseeable future. Uh, we don't see that happening, and uh, our forecast, I think, is pretty mainstream. Okay, so the deficit projected for this year is a trillion dollars, okay? And we are anticipating annual budgetary deficits, not the debt, mm -hmm. to increase a trillion dollars 
each year into the foreseeable future. That's right. So it's one point one trillion this year and rising uh, over the decade. Okay. How much has the federal debt increased in the last three years? Ah, in the last ah, uh, three years. In the th last three years. Ah, I don't have the um, the dollar figure. It's three trillion dollars. Okay, three trillion dollars. Three, tr three trillion dollars. We've, we've had close to. Yeah, I'm, I'm just. Here's dollars. my point. Here's my point. When you divert nearly two trillion dollars since 2003 to a foreign war that took out a bad sh Sunni by the name of Saddam Hussein and put in a bad Shia by the name of Nur al-Maliki, who the United States gave him his first term, Iran gave him his second term. And today, after losing 4,500 American soldiers and spending almost $2 trillion, Iraq is owned today by Iran. That's bad on its face. But in terms of the money that was diverted that otherwise could have been spent in the growth of the American economy, we have lost considerably. And I think, you know, when you look at deficit spending, a war obviously is not a good investment, nor are tax cuts, because tax cuts don't pay for themselves. Best case scenario, you can retrieve about 32 cents for every dollar that you give away in a tax cut. If you invest in education, you grow your economy, like China has done. If you invest in infrastructure, you grow your economy, like China has done. And if you invest in scientific research, you don't get beat by China when it comes to new technology like 5G, next generation. We're getting clobbered right now, and I would argue it's because we failed to invest in the right things toward the growth of the American economy. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. <clears throat> now recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as, as both you and, uh, and our Republican lead here on the committee, Mr. Womack, have pointed out, yesterday the Congressional Budget Office released its most recent baseline, which reaffirmed what we already know. And some of what I'm going to say is going to be repetitive because I don't think we can say it loudly enough nor often enough. The economy is strong. The federal deficit continues to grow at an unsustainable rate, and mandatory spending is out of control. And I want to make sure that the record is, is straight and clear. Under the previous administration, the national debt doubled in 10 years. Eight years. I'm sorry, eight years of the last administration. And much of the increase in mandatory spending that's out of control today is laws that went on the books and spending that went on the books, checks that we can't cash in the previous administration. In fiscal year 2020, CBO expects the deficit will be $1.015 trillion, making fiscal year 2020, the first year since 2012, that the deficit will eclipse $1 trillion. Additionally, CBO estimates that the debt held by the public will reach $17.9 trillion at the end of fiscal year 2020. That's 81% of GDP. And as our Republican lead, Mr. Womack, has pointed out, the outlook for mandatory spending is even more worrisome. This spending category currently accounts for 70% of the federal budget and is on track to reach 76% by 2030. There is no question that mandatory spending is the primary driver of our deficit. And yet, congressional Democrats have introduced legislation and proposals like the Green New Deal or Medicare for All that would add trillions of dollars in additional mandatory spending. Ladies and gentlemen, now is the time for Congress to address our out-of-control mandatory spending and take action to put the federal budget on a sustainable course. And I would recommend we start in this very committee by doing a budget resolution. Dr. Swagel, how relevant is the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act to the fiscal imbalance? More specifically, where would our fiscal deficit be had we not passed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act? Um, so this is in uh, April 2018. Uh, CBO did a, a comprehensive analysis of the December 2017 tax cut. And, and we see that as uh, adding about one percentage point of GDP to the deficit. So it, we cut taxes, lost revenue, increased growth that brought back some revenue, paid for roughly 20% of itself. 
Um, so it's about one percentage point of GDP out of our four, the 4.6% 4 uh, deficit that we see this year. So in some sense, that gives you a sense of the, the effect of the 2017 tax cut relative to the overall. Uh, is, it, is it safe to say that without the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, we would still be facing massive deficits over the next 10 years? Uh, yes, that's, that's correct. Okay. Uh, well, Dr. Swago, the United States economy is undergoing the largest longest economic expansion in American history. What impact has the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act had on our economy, especially when American families are keeping more of their hard-earned money as a result of the, of the legislation? Okay. So in the um, April 2018 analysis, we, we saw the uh, December 20, 2017 Tax Act affecting business investment and consumer spending. So supporting higher consumer spending, as, as you said, families keeping uh, more of their, their money, and then especially in business investment, the lower taxes on, um, on businesses would uh, spur investment. And we saw what looked to be the, uh, the response in the first half of 2018, business investment was relatively strong. It's been difficult since then, in some sense, to disentangle the effects of the, the Tax Act from subsequent developments. Um, tariff policy in particular, starting around the middle of 18, 2018, um, looks to have an effect on business investment. So it's a little hard to say um, exactly, you know, what's the tax act, what's other things, but that's how we saw it, both, effect, both supporting consumer spending and business investment. Okay. Well, you know, CBO projects that mandatory outlays for major health care programs will total $1.3 trillion. Uh, in FY 2020 and almost double to 2.5 trillion by 2030. What are the greatest factors contributing to this massive growth in federal health spending? Uh, so it is roughly divided in two. So half of it is just the aging of the population. We know uh, an older population involves more health spending. And then the other half is the excess cost growth in healthcare. The healthcare costs are just rising faster than the overall economy and that's driving the higher spending as well. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. Now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Doggett, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Director. Well, here we are in the fourth year of the reign of the king of debt, self-styled. Uh, we now face more than a trillion-dollar deficit this year, and according to your report, trillion-dollar deficits for as far as the eye can see in what you have described, as I understand it, a totally unsustainable path. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct, sir. And uh, I guess the one thing we can be in complete agreement on from what you just said is that those Republican tax cuts that we were told were going to pay for themselves have not paid for themselves, have they? Uh, we don't see the tax cut as... Yes, sir. You, I believe you just said we think that it's, from your analysis, your objective analysis, that we got about 20 cents on the dollar for every dollar of tax cuts. Is that right? That's correct, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, that's uh, uh, consistent with what all economists, except for the true ideologues, told us before this proposal was ever adopted. And if we have more of those same unpaid Republican tax cuts, which President Trump seems to feel he has to promote in order to get reelected, it will make it even more unsustainable, won't it? Uh, if you have more tax cuts than... Uh, I'll say, I'm sorry. Um, uh, that's right. The, yes. The justice is unsustainable... And, more and, tax cuts. And we were also, the Republicans had the help of uh, that great historic character, Rosie Scenario, in the, their work on this. Uh, they told us that uh, at a minimum, with, with this wonderful proposal, we'd have 3% growth. Uh, I heard President Trump say, why not 6% growth? You're just not being optimistic enough, but you have analyzed it, and what we can look forward to is less than, uh, or about half of what Republicans told us we get, only 1.7% growth is your best analysis. Is that right? That's right, over the long yeah. term. Over the long over term. 1%, 1%. Uh, and so the same people that told us, oh, we can't afford more medical research, we can't afford better schools, we can't provide health care for more Americans, we can't meet our infrastructure needs with our crumbling roads, when it came to helping the very rich in this country and multinational corporations, they could not do enough. And I want to ask you about one specific area that I've been troubled with, was troubled when they hoisted it off on us, and that is all the giveaways to the multinational corporations to just encourage them to move more jobs offshore and to have new investment offshore. You're familiar with the very appropriately named guilty provision 
in the uh, in the Republican tax bill, aren't you? Are you not? Yes, I am. And as I understand it, that gives a 50 percent deduction for profits that multinationals earn overseas. Uh, and as if that half off uh, deal, a 50 percent sale uh, that slashed the already very low corporate tax rate wasn't enough, up to a 10 percent rate of a return on tangible investments for multinationals overseas would be exempt entirely from guilty, allowing a corporation to avoid even the low discounted rate that Republicans established on offshore profits. And as far as tangible investments are concerned, isn't this when they, a corporation decides they'd rather build their plant and uh, get their equipment in some other country than in America? In other words, not putting America first. Uh, there's a, a tangible uh, investment would be a, a factory or plant. As you so say. last year, you came to us with your report and noted that the Republican tax bill uh, contained provisions like guilty that could be, quote, uh, could have an incentive effect to encourage the location of such assets abroad instead of making America first. Isn't that right? That was in your report. So the report talks about the, the overall impact of the 2017 yes. Tax Act as improving incentives to invest in the U.S., that particular provision, as you said, these international uh, provisions in to encourage abroad and the, and in, more. the, the tangible uh, and, and as if the provisions that these Republicans wrote, wrote weren't bad enough in incentivizing uh, moving offshore, the Treasury Department's been working to make it a little worse. Uh, and I read your report this year to indicate that among the factors you look at. Uh, are the regulations Treasury has written and those that have not yet gone into effect, and you say they add about another $110 billion uh, to uh, us over the next decade. Is that right? Uh, yes. So we've been uh, tracking the, the incoming data uh, related to the 2017 Tax Act. We don't have all of it just because the— Because it probably will be worse once they actually complete their uh, work. Uh, we don't have all of them in effect. We only have— part of them in effect, uh, guilty not completely in effect. Uh, likewise, the high tax exclusion beat another appropriately named provision in effect. My concern, Mr. Chairman, is that 90 corporate giants in this country paid zero, absolutely nothing, zilch, to contribute to the challenges that we face. And the Trump Treasury Department is only making it worse with their regulations. And thank you, Mr. Director and Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Stewart, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Director, thank you for being here. I'm going to ask you a question. I don't know if you're going to have the answer to it, but I think uh, it would be appreciated. We're in a little bit of uncertainty with the coronavirus, obviously, yeah. in China and, and spreading to other parts of the world, a little bit here in the U.S. It's clearly going to have an economic impact. Do you have any insights on that that you could share with us? Um, yes, of course. Uh, we've been tracking that, and we recognize that it will have economic impacts, as you, as you say. We, you know, we, we see them already with, with travel, certainly. Um, we, we recognize that the manufacturing in China looks to be disrupted. It's hard, of course, to know how long that will persist and, and ultimately what will be the effects. Um, CBO in the past has done work on similar um, instances. Back in the days of the avian flu, the CBO did um, uh, analysis. Uh, you know, I don't want to say, oh, it's going to be the same this time as then, just because we don't, you know, we don't ultimately know. But we are watching it closely, and we will provide information to the committee and, and to members as we have more. Let me ask you this: Going back historically, looking at uh, as you mentioned, avian flu or perhaps SARS, do we have an estimate of how much that impacted our econ our economy at that time? Uh, you know, I don't. Um, I don't recall offhand. You know, the avian flu, in the end, it wasn't a gigantic, gigantic impact in the U.S. It was you know, more overseas, and then it was um, uh, tamped down. And the same with SARS. It affected uh, China and others. Um, we do have some evidence from disruptions here. So it's not, it's not an epidemic, but um, you know, say the, uh, the catastrophes along the Gulf Coast from the uh, hurricanes Katrina and Rita um, you know, had massive effects on the, on the, the localities. In the grand scheme of the overall U.S. economy, it was a negative, and then we we largely made it up. So, um, you know, in some sense, it's the strength of the U.S. economy is our resilience, our flexibility that we can bounce back. 
from these sorts of uh, things. Well, and let's hope, of course, that this doesn't turn into anything more serious than what we've seen so far. And this would be just one of the impacts, the economic impacts on people. And we're starting to see some of that already, which begs the point, and that is when we have these deficits like we do, we have very little or at least much smaller margin for error. Much Our tool chest is limited in the sense of how we can respond to some of these emergencies and, uh, and respond to the economic impacts of them. Uh, boring down on that just a little bit, 2020, $170 billion increase in revenue to the federal government. Is that right? Uh, that's, uh, I, I think that's right. And, and do you have an estimate for 2021 uh, in increase in revenue? Uh, an increase in revenue, um, uh, sorry, I have it in front of me. Uh, I don't have 2021 in front of me. I okay. apologize. But, right. but revenues will continue to grow. We see them, um, uh, revenues growing at, at roughly 4 to 5% uh, uh, pace. Okay, that's, that's a fairly remarkable statement. Revenue's growing at 4 to 5%. $170 billion this year, increase in revenue. And the point is, is that we don't have a revenue problem. We've got a deficit problem that's caused by spending. That's very, very clear. And the mandatory spending on this is, you know, the key to that. I mean, 70% of the federal deficit is attributable, I'm sorry, the federal budget is attributable to mandatory spending. We all know that. And I just hope someone has the courage at some point to really take that on, because to date we haven't. But my question to you then is this. Anticipating by 2050, when we look at something like 180% of GDP in federal debt, much of that owned by not US citizens, but by foreign entities and organizations and businesses. What does that mean? And what are the national security implications of having that much debt owned by foreign entities? So um, I would first start where you started, that in, in a sense it re reduces our room, our fiscal room to maneuver. That if the, the debt is high, if um, in some sense investors' beliefs about the United States change and that leads to higher interest rates, well the negative impact of higher interest rates on our fiscal situation will, will ramp up much more quickly. Um, and in some sense that it could make policymakers hesitant to use fiscal policy as necessary, whether for national security purposes, for economic purposes, or, um, or, or anything. Is it plausible to think that someone, I mean, we hear this scenario where someone actually, a nation actually holds us hostage because of the debt that is owed to them. Is that a realistic uh, or, or plausible, uh, you know, potential that could happen? Uh, it's, you know, in, in principle, it's possible. A challenge in some sense is the codependence, say between us and China. China and Japan are the two largest holders of US uh, debt. Uh, Japan's a, t a touch above China now, but in some sense, China, if they were to try to hold us hostage, this sense in which we're in this together, that if they you know, did something that impaired US Treasury bonds, they'd be taking a big um, hit as well. Yeah. So yeah, it, is it could a happen. It is a two-way street, so, and, and that's actually the point I want to make. I mean, the idea of holding us hostage is probably exaggerated. The ability to influence our decisions and our policy, though, absolutely not. Would you agree? That's absolutely right. not an exaggerated threat. That's right. We um, increasingly depend on, on the rest of the world to finance our spending. Yeah. That's absolutely right. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Price, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and, and welcome to our witness, and thank you for your good work and your, and your testimony. Uh, we uh, often hear contrary views about uh, the deficit and the debt uh, from our Republican friends and, and all around, I suppose. We've heard some of that this morning. We all remember Dick Cheney said memorably, Deficits don't matter. Uh, they seem especially not to matter when they're created by tax cuts for the wealthy or when they're created by defense spending. But then, on the other hand, we hear the sky's falling. The sky's falling. We can't go on like this. We've heard a lot of that this morning. Um, so I, I hope you can, you, you've already done some of this, and I hope you can continue to, to give us some perspective on this. Our deficit is now 4.6% of G. GDP, our debt is 81% of GDP. Both are rising. Mm -hmm. They're high by historic standards, particularly in a time of uh, economic growth and prosperity. They're getting higher. Uh, we don't seem to be able to um, envision a uh, grand bargain such as we had back in the 90s because of, uh, frankly, Republican dogmatism on taxes. You know, everything has to be on the table. In those budget, budget deals of 1990, 1993, 1997, Everything was on the table. There was a political price to be paid, 
But um, nonetheless, I think a lot of us feel like those are some of the best votes we ever cast, where we had four years, not just of balanced budgets, but of paying off $400 billion of the national debt. Those seem to be out of reach now, those kinds of grand bargains. President Obama tried mightily, John Boehner too, but it just hasn't come together and doesn't seem likely to. So how should we look at this? What is sustainable? What would you say the economic consensus is as to what is sustainable? Is there a consensus? What would uh, the range of that be? And then uh, what should we aim for in terms of what's sometimes called fiscal space to anticipate what might happen in the economy, to undertake aggressive, counter-cyclical measures in the event of a severe downturn. So I, I assume when we talk about what's sustainable, we're thinking about that as well as some abstract number that the economists might think uh, represents a tipping point. Okay. Um, no, and in, in, in some of you've put your finger on the key questions for looking at fiscal policy into the future. Um, we know that markets today um, are, are not concerned Right? I mean, I, I've sat here and I've told you the fiscal situation is unsustainable, but interest rates remain low in the United States. The United States has the ability to undertake fiscal policy today, you know, for whatever purpose, you know, for, for stimulus, for infrastructure, for whatever the, uh, the Congress decides to do. Um, and so it's not that, in some sense, that's the difficulty, is that the challenge is not immediate, but as you said, we know it's rising, and the challenge is knowing, well, what's the, the end point, right? At what point is the debt level on the tipping point of not being sustainable. And there's not, unfortunately, not an answer in the economic uh, literature. At one point, people said, oh, maybe it's like 70% debt to GDP. And of course, we see that. You know, you see our numbers, and we are going above that without a, um, a, a problem. Um, and so I don't know. That's the challenge. I, but my last thought is the worry I have is that when we get there, when we reach the fiscal, the end of fiscal space, as you put it, it will happen quickly. And then market participants will lose their confidence in the US quickly, and sometimes it'll be too late. It'll be too late to, to address it without difficult ch uh, ch changes. Well, in that uh, scenario you described, could happen at the time of a severe downturn. That's right. We seem to be chugging right along, doing okay. just fine, and then all of a sudden, That's right. it's not that we reached a tipping point, it's that we need we need uh, substantial resources for a, uh, for a major counter-cyclical uh, measures, whether they be on the tax side or on the spending side, and, uh, and the resources simply aren't there without just an enormous increase in debt. That's right. And, and we don't know. In, in, in the last crisis, 10 years ago, right, the U.S. was able to fund right, the, the ARA and TARP and all the, you know, so all the crisis era programs. Without a, without a problem. We saw with the China situation, U.S. interest rates went down, right? So a problem in the rest of the world, people look at the U.S. as safe. And, you know, so we still have that status. The challenge is, is keeping it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Roy, for five minutes. Thank the Chairman. Uh, appreciate being here for uh, testimony today. Um, Couple of questions. Uh, did uh, this Democrat led Congress pass a budget this last year? Uh, a budget resolution? Yeah. A budget? Uh, uh, budget no, resolution. I don't, I don't believe so. No. Okay. Um, has this Democrat led Congress passed any reforms that will significantly reduce, reduce mandatory spending uh, in the last year? in this Congress? No. No. Um, a lot of blame is being directed at the president. Um, what, uh, where are spending bills, where do they originate? The uh, spending bills? Do they originate in the House of Representatives? Um, Appropriations, spending yeah. bills, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the right yeah. tax and spending. The so Democrat the Congress. House of Representatives, yeah. Um, did the House take up and pass uh, the president's um, suggested spending levels? When the president sent over suggested spending levels, did this House take up those levels or did they spend at a higher level? Uh, I don't believe they spent, the, that the Congress spent at, at what the president uh, sent over. Right, I think they spent yeah. perhaps more than what the president suggested. Yeah, I, I, I have to admit I'm not, I'm, I'm not up to date on the, right. the president's spending suggestions, but I, um, I suspect the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. 
um, did, uh, uh, did this Democrat-led Congress vote to raise the spending caps last July? Uh, yes, and our, um, our baseline reflects those higher uh, spending caps. Mm -hmm. uh, did this Democrat-led Congress vote for appropriations just this past December that will spend at those higher cap levels? Uh, yes, that's correct, and, and again, yes. that's in our baseline. Right. Um, so it, it strikes me as interesting to hear a lot of finger pointing going at the president um, about the you know record debt levels and so forth over the last several years. And of course, the questions always go back to the tax cut of 2017. One of my colleagues has rightfully raised the questions here about the percentage. I've heard the uh, my colleague from Texas talking about getting 20 cents back on the dollar. One question I have for you is a practical matter. Are you all going to do another assessment of the 2017 uh, tax uh, tax bill from, uh, just, you know, you did one in the spring of 2018. Are you going to do an update or no? We're not, you know, we're not, we're, we're tracking it. And the, the challenge is disentangling, you know, what's the 2017 Other policies. from every, everything else since then. We'll, but we'll keep tracking the, you know, as, as we can, for example, the international tax provisions, that we can track some of that. Has, is it true that um, our, our federal receipts, revenue to the federal treasury since roughly World War II is tracked somewhere between sort of 14% to 20% on average? That's right, the 50-year the average is 17.4% right. of, um, of GDP. And it's ranged between those rough That's ranges, right? right? right. And we're somewhere in that kind of middle range, maybe just below 17 right now. Like we're a little bit 16s. below that now, we're, and we're going up in um, over the over the next decade. That we're going to have 17.4 percent right. revenue to GDP. So we're um, tracking right. roughly at the same 15-year level of our overall revenues to the Treasury as a percentage of our GDP of our economy, right? Right. In dollars, it's going up as the economy gets larger. So it is safe to say that. Uh, you know, without getting into the politics of it, that if that, that the the main driver of our current imbalance is a massively growing amount of spending, and that that's obviously heavily tr tracking mandatory spending that's driving a lot of that. Correct. Right. And so there's the the gap. Right. Um, Revenue is at the 50 year is is going to be at the 50 year historic level, and spending is is higher, and that that gap is the deficit. So while we are looking at, and we can have debates about tax policy and, and, and you know, the importance of tax policy for jobs and having money in the people's pockets and creating wealth and opportunity and stimulus uh, versus, you know, uh, uh, what that may or may not mean for the net change to revenue and to the treasury, uh, and we can have that debate, the fact is spending is being driven by mandatory spending that's, you know, going to be 80% of the increase of our debt over the next decade is going to be Medicare, Social Security, and interest. Is that correct? That's correct. Those two and, mainly. Yeah. And, and right now, uh, this body, this committee, this House has got no proposals that it's putting forward to deal with those, those issues uh, and solve those problems uh, that we're dealing with. And one last question. <clears throat> when is Medicare Part A going to be insolvent? Uh, it's um, in our um, uh, in our projection is 2025. And when is so, uh, Social Security going to be insolvent? Right. So we have the 2032, 2032. Social Security. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. Okay, very good. And actually, I should just add, um, you know, in our baseline, even when those trust funds become insolvent, we have in our baseline the spending continues because we're directed to do that by the budget law. Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Gentlemen's time has expired. I now recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Tchaikovsky, for five minutes. Uh, climate change, I see, is the greatest challenge facing humanity today. And across the globe, we see near apocalyptic um, events like the um, continent wide fires in Australia, flooding in Venice, and in the United States, we're seeing catastrophic flooding, um, severe storms, wildfires, and devastating drought. In Chicago, where I'm from, um, we've seen the lake at levels that we haven't seen um, before, threatening the shoreline across the area. And the Great Lakes generate $16 billion every year in tourism uh, revenues, so the climate crisis could have disastrous economic effects um, for our region and really for the, the country, if not the world. 
certainly the world. In 2019 alone, the United States was impacted by 14 separate billion dollar disasters. Um, if we do not take immediate action, um, the future economic and social costs of climate change will be breathtakingly high. And so I want to ask you, Director, and thank you for being here, um, how are these climate-related natural disasters and severe storms expected to affect the federal budget and economic outlook going forward, especially noting that we are predicting to see increased number of billion-dollar disasters in the near future? It's an issue that we're looking at carefully. Um, and in some sense, on two levels. One is to say, what are the effects on the, the micro level in the, in the um, economic baseline, in the fiscal baseline? So it's the flood insurance program, uh, military installations, and other, uh, other things are affected. Um, and so we're looking at that. Those are implicitly, in our, they're in our baseline. But we don't, we don't have a particular estimate of you know, flood insurance spending will go up by a certain amount because of climate. But we're working to understand that. The, the bigger challenge, as you say, is overall the macro picture, where we know that c the climate change will have an effect on the overall economy, and therefore on federal revenue and federal spending. And that, we're also uh, working to uh, understand that. It, it might not show up in a, a big way you know, in the next year, or even in the next 10 years, but we know as we look at a 30-year horizon, the overall US economy um, will be affected. I'm really shocked that for you to say that, that it may not show up in the, ne in the next decade because it's showing up right now. Given our current economic conditions of uh, persistently low interest rates and low inflation rates, would you agree that it is sound fiscal policy for the government to invest in a clean economy now? Uh, okay. So, and I should, I should actually make, make, make clear, is this the showing up is saying, you know, will GD, the level of GDP be different and therefore the level of revenue is, of course, showing up as, as economic impacts, just trying to trace them through precisely to the budget is... Um, is, is and I would add, you could also talk to the farmers. Um, we were um, over a month late getting into the field in Illinois. Um, the economic impacts are so obvious. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it's an issue that, uh, in the area, I'm sorry, in which the CBO did a, a lot of work back in... Um, 2013, I think, when the Waxman-Markey legislation, the, the cap-and-trade legislation, was um, being debated, we haven't worked on that basically a, a lot since, and we're starting that up again, so we'll have more to say. On the investment uh, part, I'm sorry, I didn't answer the second part of your question, that's something we're also, um, again, starting to look at, is to connect those policy levers to the, the economy and to the baseline. Yeah, I mean, I would hope um, that CBO could actually help Congress analyze these situations and help us come up with long-term um, plans on how we how we deal with that. I mean, I, it's again, it's just surprising to me that while you're beginning to look at that and trying to understand that, that this is a major force in our country today that I think is changing the economics in so many ways. That's right, and in some ways, we we know that that. We need to do our work, so we're ready to support the Congress. And that's, that's what we're doing. First, in, in, on the baseline, the usual, what does it mean for the budget? And then um, over the coming months, to, to understand better how various policy levers will affect climate and then affect the economy and, uh, and so on. You know, I mean, I, I think the question of what kind of investments are smart for our uh, economy for, to make us more resilient, I think that you have a big role to play, and I hope you will, and I yield back. Uh, gentlelady's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Flores, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Director Swagel. We really appreciate you being here. Um, this hearing today is incredibly important. The testimony we're hearing today clearly lays out uh, that our one of our country's biggest challenges are growing deficits and uh, growing debt are uh, are unsustainable. Our growing de deficit and debit, and excuse me, debt and deficit represent a huge tax and fiscal obligation for future generations. Uh, those generations are going to face daunting challenges of lower economic growth opportunities and massive tax increases. The tragedy of today's hearings is that the majority of this committee and the House of Representatives have buried its head in the sand and is failing to govern by passing a budget to clearly share its priorities with the American people. Do they have a budget to address the country's fiscal challenges? No. Do they have a budget which shows the true cost of their socialist projects like the Green New Deal, Medicare for All, free college programs, 
uh, that will explode the deficits and debt by over $100 trillion. No. Do they have any kind of budget? No. Even worse, to deflect from their failure to govern by passing a budget, they try to blame deficits on pro-growth tax reforms that went into effect two years ago. The tax reform that's helping to grow our economy, the tax reform that has grown federal deficit, federal revenues to record levels, the tax reform that has created millions of jobs, the tax reform that has reduced unemployment, the tax reform that has lifted millions of families out of poverty, the tax reform that's helped grow incomes for lower income American families by significantly higher rates than other income groups. So in light of this foggy rhetoric by the majority, it's important to address the issues that we face today. In order to do this, let's look at a few issues. So Director Slagle, Swagel, I want to ask about what part the tax reform plays in federal debts and deficits. So what is the total amount of expected federal revenues over the next 10 years? $48 uh, trillion? Dollars? It's, uh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. And what's the total revenue impact, based on CBO's estimates, of tax reform over the next 10 years? Is it $1.9 trillion? Uh, that's right. The, the loss okay. of 10 years is, is one And so a little simple math here shows that the percentage of tax reform impact compared to total revenues is 4%. That means 96% of federal revenues were unaffected. So tax reform is clearly not the big issue here. And so what are the projected deficits over the next 10 years, about $13.1 trillion, right? Yep. And so if you divide uh, $13.1 trillion by $1.9 trillion, you see that the total impact of tax reform on the deficits over the next 10 years is about 14%. That means 86% of federal deficits is because of something else. And so let's, bring, let's look at this slide. This is CBO slide seven. And this shows that revenues are growing faster than the rate of the economy, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, right. that's good. That means deficits should be reduced. Mm -hmm. We go to the next slide. It shows that discretionary spending is growing at a rate slower than the rate of the economy, uh, growth of the economy, right? And GDP, right. okay, that's good. Okay, this brings us to the key issue. The two areas that are growing faster than the rate of growth in the economy are uh, mandatory expenditures and net interest. Now, so those are the issues that need, be, need to be addressed. So historically speaking, if revenues grow faster than the economy and expense, expenditures grow slower than the rate of the economy, then our debts and deficits should be reduced, right? Uh, that's right. Okay. Uh, I'm saying this, I'm a CPA, a former chief financial <laughs> officer, a former uh, CEO, so I look at the, I try to analyze this from a business perspective. So if we really want to get our arms around this, what's in the mandatory spending category that's blowing things up? Well, let me ask you one other question. So what are revenues in the last year of your projections, 2030? It's like $5.7 trillion, I think. Yeah, it's, um, I'm sorry, I'm just going to look. It's as a percentage of GDP, it's- No, just uh, in dollars. Uh, in dollars, it's, it's 5.75 trillion. Okay, and what are total mandatory expenditures in that same year? Uh, it's about 4.9 trillion. Okay, I was thinking it was 5.7, which leaves- yeah. Yep, uh, mandatory is, is uh, in 2030, is like $4.9 trillion. Okay, and then yeah. when you add debt to it, and the then, net uh, interest? Right, net interest is, is another $800 uh, billion. Okay, so 5.7 5 5 trillion. 7, exactly, yeah, between Okay, two, all right. Two. I do yep. study the numbers. Yep. So that means that mandatory expenditures and net interest on that will absorb 100% of total revenues. That means there's no money left for anything else, for the FBI, for national security, for border security for anything else, right? Yes. Okay, that's, that's so really what this says is that we as Congress need to address the big issues here that nobody wants to address. And uh, I, it's my hope that the majority will work with the minority, the Republicans, Democrats will sit down together, address these challenges head on so that we can balance the budget and take care of future generations. Thank you, I'll yield back. Gentleman's time has expired, and I recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Kildee, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Director Swagel, for being, being here. One area that um, I've been very interested in um, is understanding how investments or policy um, impacts the economy through the externalities that they generate. And obviously, in some cases, we measure that, in some cases, we don't. I'm not talking about those benefits that are promised, that are difficult to measure, or that some claim, like in the, in the case of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, 
are taking place when we know that that particular policy is only returning 20 cents on the dollar of investment. Uh, and that's something that both sides seem to readily acknowledge. Not good math, not supporting that policy at all. But specifically, I'd like to get your thoughts on the impact of another set of policies and the external benefits that be, would be derived, and that has to do with, with infrastructure spending. According to the Economic Policy Institute, the rate of return on infrastructure is tremendous. Lots and lots of economic studies have pointed this out. In 2010, you may be familiar with the work that Moody's Analytics did, looking at uh, fiscal stimulus for a whole variety of governmental activities, um, tax cuts, uh, increases in SNAP program spending, but specifically infrastructure, where their analysis determined that for every dollar of infrastructure investment, there's a return of $1.57 to the economy. It's a big difference between getting 20 cents back on the dollar and getting $1.57 back on the dollar. Um, I know you may not specifically project or measure that, but it is your assessment that infrastructure spending would have a net positive impact on the economy and on our fiscal condition? Uh, so um, certainly on the economy, infrastructure, uh, investment, if, if well done, uh, has the ability to, to Im improve GDP and have the kind of positive external effects that you mentioned that would have feedback to the, the budget. You know, the challenge is the precise infrastructure that's done. I think we all know, right, there's you know, the high-speed rail in the middle of nowhere, and there's a sort of, you know, fixing the bridge that's key. Right, but if we're talking about the kind of investments that would clearly be tied to efficiencies in delivering products to market, mm -hmm. particularly uh, when, it's, when we talk about supporting the American manufacturer in our very, you know, steep global competition that we're facing, understanding what our competitors are doing, China, for example, spending 10 times what we are as a percentage of GDP. It does seem to me to be not only good fiscal policy, but good policy in general for us to make these sorts of significant investments. And then we get the additional reward mm -hmm. of significant return to the economy. Is that your, do you share that general view? I, I do, and, and as you said, it's, it's very important that there are gonna be things that, that cost money but have a huge impact on the economy. And in some sense, the, you know, if it costs money, sometimes it's worth it. That it's, not, it's not the only standard. Right. If I could just then return to a, a point that was made by one of my colleagues on the other side uh, about this issue um, of, our, of our deficits and debt. The point was made that while 14% of projected uh, uh, deficits are attributable to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, in other words, that bill, that legislation made our situation worse, no question about that, the solution that's being suggested over and over again, is to deal with so-called mandatory spending. What percentage of the mandatory spending is constituted of uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, roughly? You don't have That's, to give me three sides. It's size. by far the largest part. Right. I don't and know, so, but it's by far. What, I think we need to be clear on what's being said. They're not, the, the discussion is, it's okay to give tax cuts to benefit the people at the very top, but you have to offset that by cutting Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. Because if the real interest is in reforming those programs, we're all ears. In fact, we have legislation. One of my colleagues said there's no plan from Democrats. We have a plan on Social Security with 208 Democratic sponsors that would deal with Social Security and make it stable as far as the eye could see. We invite our Republican colleagues to join us in that, and if they have suggestions on how we might improve that legislation, we're all ears. But to take the president's proposal to cut Medicare and the president's proposal to cut Social Security and call that reform by placing it on the backs of the people who can least afford it, but happily celebrate and throw parties and parades for tax policy that gave the wealthiest people in this country massive breaks at the cost of everyone else, and then say, well, it only added to 14% of our fiscal problem is not a very good argument. So I appreciate your time here. I've gone over time, and I yield back. Mr. Chairman, can I, can I respond? Please respond, one, sure. One sentence. I'm not responding. It's just um, when I referred to high-speed rail, I realized saying in the middle of nowhere is a, is a poor way of putting it. Um, and so I, I really had in mind uh, investment projects that have a 
you know, a low return and not trying to you know, say a bad thing about any particular part of the country. All right, th thank you for that clarification. Uh, now recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Woodall, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When I flee to the family farm, it is in the middle of nowhere, and I go exactly. for precisely that reason. That's so I took no offense uh, to that. I, I don't want high-speed <laughs> rail in my back uh, in my backyard there. Um, I, I'm listening to the to the finger pointing going back and forth. I want to confess I've been here nine years. A lot of this is my fault, um, and I appreciate the work CBO has done uh, during that uh, time. It, it, to, to work with such great uh, men and women on both sides of the aisle and having not been able to make more of a an impact is incredibly disappointing. Uh, to me, uh, but you know, there was a time when uh, uh, when we passed that 74 uh, Budget Act uh, and uh, constituted this committee that we said we're tired of taking orders from the White House, uh, we're tired of OMB running the show, and we need to create an institution uh, that uh, will put us on equal uh, footing. Uh, and what has transpired over those past 40 years is we've dwarfed uh, OMB, uh, and there's not uh, a president of either administration. Uh, that uh, isn't uh, uh, playing with the OMB numbers, and America looks uh, to you all uh, as, the, uh, as the fair arbiter in that space. I thank you uh, for taking on that responsibility. Um, I want to look up here at, the, at, the, at, your, uh, at your slide. Um, uh, tell me what, uh, what is reflected there in 2009, 2010 in that giant spike in, in mandatory spending as a percent of GDP. Uh, so it was, it was both... Um uh, of course, GDP was going down because we were in a uh, recession, um, and then uh, there's a variety of mandatory expenditures that went up, uh, increased uh, transfers and, uh, and other things, uh, and the Affordable Care Act since it's, uh, created a, a new um, category of mandatory spending. And so as the economy has uh, not just uh, uh, recovered but uh, begun to expand, I would expect to, to see all of the uh, crisis response uh, go away, and in fact, uh, begin to trend the other direction. I, I don't see that. I see a systemic uh, increase of several uh, percentage points there. Uh, is that uh, the Affordable Care Act uh, in its uh, in its entirety? Am I looking at something else there? No, it's not. I mean, that the increase in, in mandatory spending, the higher level, it's a mix of the new, you know, new legislation and then the trend of um, the two trends I mentioned, the aging and the excess cost growth in health care. So it's a mix of, of those. The, Mr. Kildee was talking about investment in transportation. I appreciate your distinction between investment and smart uh, investment. Uh, if I could get more projects out the road, uh, out the door faster, uh, we, could, we could seek those benefits uh, and find them faster. Uh, he mentioned the figure of about $1.50 for every dollar invested. Uh, you're projecting trillion dollar deficits. If I then find two trillion in new revenue, uh, would you, uh, uh, and we spend it all uh, on, in a new transportation project, would you expect us then to be able to, to have a zero deficit that following year because that two trillion would yield the additional trillion that we, that we needed? Uh, no, I wouldn't expect uh, wouldn't. that. And in some sense, right, that would be like a, a pay-go. There might be some benefit, but it wouldn't reduce the existing deficit. They, uh, so let's look at the, at the uh, trend lines there with discretionary and, and net interest. Uh, it looks like what you're suggesting is we argue so much about how to invest in schools and how to invest in roads and how to invest in, in basic science. It looks like you're saying because of the debts that we have incurred on both sides of the aisle that we are going to be spending almost half as much paying our creditors as we spend on all investment in America combined. That's right. The discretionary spending includes all essentially all federal investment. Have any members of Congress come to you in your capacity as our budget uh, uh, analyst uh, to say, uh, I'm excited about this figure, and how can we make sure that net interest payments rise even higher uh, uh, to replace, uh, crowd out what would have been investment? No, sir. Right. I'm looking at uh, Politico. They keep track of the presidential candidates. I was disappointed in the Republicans uh, last cycle because no one campaigned on balancing the budget. Uh, they say of the, of the 27 Democratic uh, members who have been in the presidential uh, election mix uh, so far, uh, including past and former members of this committee, uh, absolutely none has taken a position uh, on debt that of all the questions asked, we're not talking about uh, debt. Uh, 
Here you are uh, looking at this. I, I, I would have a tough time getting out of bed every morning if I had your job uh, because uh, it, there is doom and gloom out there on the, on the horizon. Not that we can't solve problems, but that for whatever reason, we haven't been able uh, to come together to do that in, in quite uh, some time. What, what is it that you see as a, as a professional economic analyst mm -hmm. that, that, that I need to see to help me understand why this isn't captivating the American people in a way that, that pushes the, the, the key leaders on both sides of the, of the aisle to, to complete, the, to, to not only not to address it, but to completely ignore it in our, in our campaign seasons. So I look at the vertical dashed line um, of today and, and then look at the net interest. And so that's the challenge is interest rates are low and interest rates have remained low and the cost of financing our debt has been modest you know, even as our debt has increased. Um, and, and that's the challenge, is, is getting a start on addressing the situation over time. It's not, it doesn't have to be done the second, it's not emergency, but it's a long-term challenge, and, and that's the challenge of starting. We're only one major crisis away then, Mr. Chairman, from getting our presidential candidates and, and presidents uh, to focus on this, uh, this issue. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, the gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize the Vice Chairman of the committee, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Moulton, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I also want to thank uh, my colleague, Mr. Woodall, because I'd like to pick, off ex pick up exactly where you left off, uh, because I do care about the debt. Uh, Director Swiggle, do you care about the debt? Uh, I do, yes. It sounds like Mr. Woodall cares about the debt as well, and so if you get a chance to see the President, you can tell him that at least the three of us <laughs> provide an answer to his question that he asked recently at a private fundraiser where he said, who the hell cares about the debt? Good to know there are at least three of us in answer to the president's question. You know, as a candidate, President Trump said that he, would, he could eliminate the national debt quickly. Of course, as president, he's added $3 trillion to the debt during his first three years in office. So are we on track to eliminate the national debt? No, Mr. we're Director? not. Despite the president's claims as a candidate, you stated that, and I quote, not since World War II has the country seen deficits during times of low employment that are as large as those that we project nor in the past century has it experienced large deficits for as long as we project, end quote. What single law signed by President Trump is the single largest contributor to the deficit and debt growth over a 10-year period? Um, well, that would be the December 2017 Tax Act. The Tax Cut and Jobs Act, in other words, as the President refers to it. So I'd like to now shift taking that line of questioning and move over to where Mr. Price left off because he talked about what happens when the debt to GDP ratio gets to a point where it's unsustainable. And you said that there will be a tipping point where that happens, though it's hard to predict exactly where that tipping point is. You then said that the effects will be felt very quickly. Mr. Director, what are those effects? What sort of effects could we expect to see? Um, so when we reach that point, we would, if um, the fiscal crisis happens, it would come about as investors lose faith in the, the willingness or ability of the United States to repay our, our debt without giving rise to high inflation. Right? We borrow in dollars, so of course we can always print more dollars. That would lead to inflation and, uh, and so on. So we, we'd have higher interest rates, higher inflation. The higher interest rates and inflation would lead to um, negative impacts on consumer spending, business investment, and therefore the overall economy. And so would we likely see a, a major recession? I mean, what, what sort, how would this play out mm -hmm. in the lives of ordinary Americans? That's right. It would, um, has the potential to be a severe negative economic impact um, with uh, job creation slowing or, or going negative, uh, output slowing or going negative. Um, and again, I'm not, that's not in our projection. And I'm not saying that's happening in 10 years or even in 30 years. It's just that the potential uh, is there with our rising debt. But as Mr. Woodall said, it's, it's that crisis that we might have to reach before more people, other than the three of us in America, apparently care about the debt to answer the, question, the president's question. Um, and so that's the challenge for policymakers is, is, is starting and sometimes taking the first step. That's right. And, and if, if, since we don't know when this tipping point would occur, I mean, if it were to happen um, soon, mm -hmm. uh, do we have a lot of space in fiscal or monetary policy to react quickly and to avert a crisis? Um, 
you know, that's where we look at financial markets today, and we see interest rates are low, and that's in our baseline. We, we've marked down our interest rate projection. That suggests we do have the space today. If there's some problem today, whether it's economic or national security, we have the fiscal ability if, if the Congress chooses to respond. And how should the Congress respond in, that, in, that, in the event of such a crisis? Ah, um, of course, you, you won't get policy suggestions from CBO, but you will get an analysis. So if there's a, you know, an economic crisis and you tell us to analyze you know, this spending or this tax cut or whatever, we will give you our best analysis. Is your, is your, in your best analysis, has uh, creating such large debt during a time of low unemployment been good policy? Uh, it's, um, you know, it's the noteworthy thing about the economic and budget situation today is that the deficit is wide and the debt is rising when the economy is as strong. And so it's, it's unusual, um, and, it, and so it, it makes the challenge we face yet larger. Would you say that unusual is a euphemism for bad? I, I was thinking of, um, uh, well, President Kennedy. Perhaps terrible? Right, I was thinking of President Kennedy, his um, inaugural address, right, was fix the roof while the sun is shining. In a sense, that's, that's the challenge, is to figure out how to do, uh, how to do that on the fiscal, uh, fiscal side. And that's obviously what we're failing to do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Now recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Burchett, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, ranking member. Um, I won't bore you with questions that have already been asked, so I'll try to put it down a little bit on my level so that at least I'll understand your answer. And I, I appreciate you, brother. I appreciate you being here. Your report stated that the deficit had reached a trillion dollars, and that debt is held by the public and it's risen to 81% of the GDP. That number, as you reported, is projected to rise to 98% by 2030 and by 180% by 2050. I think that's ridiculous. Uh, it's clear to me that we lack discipline when it comes to responsibly spending hard-earned taxpayer dollars. I'm always, I hate it when either side uh, tries to uh, belittle small business or anything else and tells them how they need to better manage their money when we, um, I mean, we give, we make drunken sailors look good. I know Crenshaw's a sailor, but he's not a drunk, so I can say that beside <laughs> him. But um, uh, Dr. Swagel, how can Congress scale back our irresponsible spending habit without having a devastating effect on the economy? Uh, um, in a sense, the, the fiscal space, um, that, we're, that several of your colleagues have, have discussed um, means that we have the ability to do this over time, right? There doesn't have to be a, a wrenching change in, you know, whether on the spending side or on the revenue side, that we can address this over time. And in a sense, the sooner we, um, we act as a nation, again, it doesn't have to be tomorrow, but the sooner we act, the, the, the um, more manageable will be the changes and the, um, the less the, the disruption to our economy and, and to small businesses and others, as you, uh, as you say. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll yield back the rest of my time, and I won't bother you with running down my friends across the aisle or any of my predecessors, so I'll just leave it at that. I'll gentleman, save that for another day. Gentleman yields back. Uh, I now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Panetta, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ranking Member Womack, uh, and thank you, Director, for being here, and thank you for your service. Um, and I guess thank you for giving us this report this information, which is actually a pretty stark warning, a warning that, as you've said, deficits are pretty much growing beyond our control. But what puts the fear in me is that deficits are, deficits are growing beyond our will to control it. It's almost like we've gotten to a point where we've given up. It's what it feels like. And that's why we're returning to trillion dollar deficits for the first time since 2012. Our national debt is expected to surpass 31 million by the end of 2030. And the debt service will take up a larger share of the federal spending, leaving less for everything else that we've talked about. And of course, it's gonna to lead to higher risks of fiscal crises, crises and hamper our ability to respond to those types of crises. Yet, we're hearing a range of perspectives on our debt and deficits, that we're in a debt emergency and we have to dramatically cut spending today, or that it's a long-term issue and really not something we need to deal with right now. I don't agree with either of those. 
I do agree with the fact that we need to start developing a plan to combat long-term deficit growth. Because I think as we're seeing, the truth is that neither party, Democrats or Republicans, are doing anything right now to get our fiscal house in order, unfortunately. Doesn't mean we have to forego important investments, okay? We understand that. We don't have to forego infrastructure, our students, our families. But it's clear that our debt will make it harder to continue making these types of worthy investments. And it means that we will need to be fiscally responsible when it comes to our spending, and yes, raise the revenue to do it. It means that we will need a plan to control health care costs and prescription drug prices. We will need legislation like the Social Security Act, Social Security 2100 Act, and restore solvency to our Social Security trust funds. And yes, we will need to repeal provisions of the 2017 tax law, which are contributing to our current deficit without providing the growth needed to offset it and ensure that the wealthy are paying their fair share. And I appreciate what Professor Price said, that everything does need to be on the table when addressing this issue when it comes to our deficit. And that includes us, this committee, putting things on the table. It includes this committee having a role to play. And I do believe that this committee can begin by getting back to passing budget resolutions and discussing ways to reform the budget process. I'm hopeful that we in this committee will take a serious look, not just at the drivers of the deficit, but also explore ways to ensure a fiscally sound policy in the future. <coughs> now, that being said, Director, what do you feel this committee can do to reduce future deficit spending? Um, and of course, I have to start by saying, right, we'll, we'll support you, we'll give you the analysis, we won't give you the policies, um, but you've put your finger on the challenge, um, and, and can I just add one, you know, small dimension to it, which in a sense, imagine a policy of PAYGO, right, which would be a step, you know, in the direction of fiscal responsibility, but there's also a sense in which by taking off pay fors by taking them off the table and spending them, well, that doesn't address the existing challenge, and in some ways makes it more difficult, because then other things have to be done, whether spending or, or revenue, to address the challenge. And sometimes that's, that's how difficult it is, that pay-go is not enough, and in some ways it makes it more difficult, you know, again, without evaluating the, the merits or demerits of any particular project. Understood. Would, uh, in your analysis, so I'll make it easier for you to answer it, in your analysis, would this committee passing a budget resolution or uh, trying to reform the budget process, would that help? Um, I mean, that, that wouldn't show up directly in the baseline. And of course, that would change the, the, the way we work, and we would work however the Congress uh, directs us to. Uh, On that note, what do you think of biennial budgeting? Uh, reduce deficits. I mean, or biennial appropriating. Right. So I, I, I have not looked at that. We haven't looked at it since I've been director. Um, you know, I recognize in terms of the advantages and disadvantages of, you know, in terms of giving the Congress, you know, more time and, and space to, in terms of think further down the road. Um, and of course, the disadvantages of less control, in a sense. Understood. Thank you. I appreciate your service. And thanks again, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Hearn, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member. Director, thank you for being here. I want to give you a shout out for you and your team and the work you do to produce tools that we can do our work better. I would encourage all of my colleagues to go review your website. You have a tremendous amount of information on there. Uh, I spent some late nights reading a lot of your outlooks, not yours personally, but your, uh, mm -hmm. your group from all the way back in 2000. So it's interesting to see the predictions over the, over the, po the various policies. You know, it's interesting that we take in 3.6 trillion, which is the highest we've ever taken in as a country, and we still can't seem to get our, our um, budgets balanced. Uh, <laughs> most American people, if not all, find that just impossible to even comprehend. We, we do have a problem that we need to get after. Um, we have a, it's kind of run amuck, if you will. Uh, I, I, you know, it's when you look at the China and Japan own probably more than half of our foreign debt that, between the two of them, and it kind of vacillates back and forth between where they're at. Uh, one likes us, the other not so much, and it's very troubling. Uh, I go back and remember in July 17, uh, when General Mad Dog Mattis testified before Congress, uh, 
He said the national debt is the biggest national security threat we must face. As President Eisenhower noted, the foundation of military strength is their economic strength. In four short years, however, we'll be paying more on interest on our debt than will be bigger bill than we pay for our national defense. Much of that interest will be money that is destined to leave America for overseas. If we refuse to reduce our debt or pay down our deficit, what is the impact of the national security of future generations who will inherit their irresponsible debt and taxes to service it? No nation in history has maintained its military power if it failed to keep its fiscal house in order. So this is not a Republican issue. This is not a Democrat issue. This is a national security issue. We must come together to mitigate this threat. Uh, you know, many would say that we've created the greatest Ponzi scheme by taking economic, economic opportunity away from future generations to pay for our insatiable appetite to spend today. Uh, Director Swagel, would you agree that this is good, be, could become a national security threat if we don't get this house in order? Yes, sir, I, I agree and agree with General Mattis. And, and we saw that in the chart that was put up before, that in some sense says discretionary spending, uh, it, it doesn't have to be squeezed, but is, is revenue essentially equals mandatory and, uh, and net, um, net interest payments, discretionary inevitably will be uh, squeezed. So, so, so Director Swagel, in your analysis, would you agree that uh, Republicans and Democrats are responsible for this? I mean, if you go back to President Bush, he doubled the debt from five to 10 trillion, Obama from 10 to 20 trillion. Certainly President Trump's not on a pathway to double it from 20 to 40 trillion, but we have equal responsibility. And there's a lot of politics that come into the budget process, which it shouldn't. We have a, this is a, this is a numbers game, right? I mean, it's really about uh, balancing our budget, revenues, uh, not uh, uh, expenses, not exceeding revenues and, and getting after it. We saw it, it can be done back in 97, 8, 9, 2000. Uh, American citizens look at us as failing to do our basic job of creating a budget and living within our means. Nobody understands. It's one of the highest percentage in, in surveys that are done. Why can't you do your job? Um, Mr. Swigel, could you, you're a student of, of your job. Mm -hmm. Could you describe to us the purpose of the Congressional Budget Act of 1974? Ah, so um, it was referred to earlier, in some sense, to give the Congress the tools and the information that the executive had already with, uh, with OMB. And so that is our job. You know, first and foremost is to provide the Congress with support on the budget and the, you know, the, the numbers and the analysis. Um, uh, so you have the report we did today that gives you that information, and then when there's legislation, we will work and do our best to provide the Congress with cost Dire estimates. Director, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just no, running please, out of time. But, but it also laid out a format by which we would get the President's budget, the House and the Senate's budget, we'd reconcile the budgets, mm -hmm. and the President's is really pr pretty much a policy guideline. It wasn't, uh, wasn't legislative uh, edict. And that we would create a budget, we'd authorize the monies, uh, 302s and 302Bs and all these things, and we would have a budget produced so that we knew what our spending was going to be on October 1. Is that correct? That's correct. How many times has that been done since 1974? Boy. Let me help you. Four question. times. Four times. Do you okay. know when the last time was it was done? I don't know. 1996. Mm. So the, bud the Congress has failed, this committee has failed to do its job and get the, the, house, in the, the house on both sides of the aisle have failed to get that done in the last... 34, 24 years, 24 years, we have not done our job. So we have to come together to get a budget. There's nobody in this in this room personally, or if you're a business person that runs a business or your personal life without a budget. And we shouldn't come in here and be political and not get that done as well. Again, I applaud you for the work you do uh, and, and staying out of the policy world, but we need to collectively come and do our job. This is not the president's fault. It's not the Senate's fault. We have to originate a budget out of here and we have to come together get the leaders of our respective houses when we're in the majority to get that done. So, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate it. I yield back. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Scott, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's, it's not equal uh, blame. We have a chart that um, is coming up that just reminds people. Uh, it's all the House's fault. No, before you can spend, you have to pass the House and the Senate and be signed by the President. The President has outsized uh, power in this, and we'll notice that from Nixon and Ford all the way through uh, uh, President Trump, every Republican president has come in and made the de budget deficit worse. And since Carter, every Democratic president has come in and made the deficit position better, without exception. The next chart shows that the $1.5 trillion tax cut plus interest brings it up to closer to $2 trillion. Uh, um, when uh, President Obama's economic plan was passed, it was at the top of the unemployment, and you can see that there's 
it, it reduced the uh, unemployment rate. Um, and uh, when um, a plan twice as big came in, you don't see a wrinkle in the trend line. The next is in the uh, jobs. Uh, we'll notice uh, this is in October, the last uh, 33 months of the uh, Trump administration, first 33 months, 189,000 jobs a month, 240, 224,000 jobs under Obama. Again, not a wrinkle. In terms of the um, um, uh, in uh, economy by the, um, um, by the Dow, Dow has gone up significantly more under Obama than, uh, than under Trump. And Mr. Um, Chairman, I'd ask unanimous consent to introduce into the record an article in Fortune magazine entitled, The S&P 500 is at an all-time high, but markets still performed far better under Obama than Trump. That objection so ordered. Thank you. Um, Mr. Swagel, um, we've heard a lot of comment about bills that have been introduced on the Democratic side without a comment that under the Democratic um, um, protocol, anything would have to be paid for before it got passed. Um, let me talk about an unpaid for tax cut that actually passed under the Republicans. Uh, you mentioned that there were investment uh, as of, of the benefits of that tax cut where 80% of the benefits went to the top 1% in corporations. How much of those benefits to corporations were invested in stock buybacks and dividends compared to increased jobs and higher salaries? Uh, so we, we don't have a precise parsing of what went into, you know, as you said, uh, buybacks and, and investment. We, we do see an investment response, but we don't, we, we can't divvy that up. Of Isn't it true that a substantial portion went to stock buybacks and dividends? Uh, so um, we have tracked that, that uh, corporations have returned capital to their shareholders, including through stock buybacks. Okay, and that, um, that's not like more jobs and higher, higher salaries. And the, can you comment on the projected interest we're going to be paying in 2030 at the rate we're going compared to discretionary spending? Uh, so, um, and we saw that on the, the chart, that um, the net interest at the end of our uh, budget window will be uh, near, uh, uh, nearly half of, um, of discretionary spending. That would be more than non-defense discretionary spending? It's certainly more than non-defense discretionary spending. That's right. Um, and at the end of 20, in 2001, there was a projection. You weren't here then, but under the, after President, when President Clinton left office, we were supposed to pay off the entire debt held by the public by 2008. Is that right? Uh, yes, I do. I wasn't here, but I do remember that. Which means that we would be paying zero interest, not more than the entire non-defense discretionary spending. Uh, that that's right, and of course, there's the the recession and subsequent legislation that have changed that. Well, that yeah, we messed estimate. it up because we passed two tax cuts without paying for it, prescriptive drug benefit without paying for it, paid, fought two wars without paying for it, and all of a sudden, guess what? We're back in the ditch. Um, none of that paid for under. Uh, the Democratic leadership, we had PAYGO. If you want a new plan, you got to pay for it. Can you say a word about what income inequality does to our budget, uh, to your budget projections? Um, uh, um, so income inequality is part of our, uh, uh, part of our budget. It affects um, both spending and revenue. Um, uh, and you know, so rising inequality in some sense affects um, uh, what's happening at the, at the bottom of the distribution with, with more uh, entitlement spending, uh, and that flows through, through into the, the fiscal situation. Um, it, it poses a challenge for the long-term budget that we know that increasing inequality has um, particular effects on, on families, on children, and in some sense on the intergenerational transmission of, um, of, of poverty to the future, which again feeds back to the economy. So in some sense, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I, I'll bring this together. There's both the, the immediate impacts on the you know, spending programs from inequality, and then I have in mind the longer term impacts on what does it mean for us as a nation and our growth trajectory. And the more in, inequality, the worse it is for the budget? Um, that is a good question. I don't know, actually, because. Well, that's what you just said. I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, it, the, the, the challenge worse. is that, um, that because of the progressive nature of our tax system, that you know, income at the top is taxed by more than income at the bottom. So I just, I, I, I can't in my head say offhand. So that's why I'm, I'm not sure, 
but I know it, it's an economic challenge even if, the, if I can't parse out the, the fiscal impact right away. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Muser, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Swagel, do you agree our labor market is strong, our unemployment rate is at historic lows of 3.5 percent, wages are rising. Despite this extremely robust economy, our country is still on a very concerning financial path due to excessive spending habits? Uh, yes. Yeah, so as, as you said, the economy um, uh, has, has pretty good growth, and the unemployment rate is low, and the labor market is strong with rising wages throughout the distribution, and especially um, strong wage growth uh, at the bottom of the distribution, even, and as we said before, the, the deficit remains wide, even as the economy uh, looks to be in pretty good shape. Revenues are up 5% in 2019, projected the same in 2020. Spending is up uh, quite a bit more. Um, in 2019 and projected for 2020, um, and is in, uh, spending is uh, dramatically uh, uh, projected to increase over the next 10 years. But revenues are up 5%. That was the former revenue secretary for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. The best growth year in revenues we ever had was 2.9%. We ended up having quite a surplus without tax increases. So a 5% increase in revenues after the, the Trump Jobs Act and, and tax cuts um, is still a very healthy revenue growth rate. Would you say? Um, uh, compared to other countries, uh, uh, it's a good question. I, I don't know about compared to other countries, um, uh, but it's. Um, it, I mean, revenues are growing, as you said, by five percent, and um, at the end of our projection, we're going to be right back to the, the historical average for revenues as a share of GDP. So I'm going to continue. The federal budget cumulative de deficit is projected, as you have said, at $1 trillion in 2020. That's an increase of $31 billion from 19 to 20. It is not an, an increase from year to year of $1 trillion, as some people um, uh, try to make it out or maybe misunderstand. Mm -hmm. Now, let's just compare to the Obama administration for, strictly for the purpose of comparing. Revenues in, uh, let's use 2015, the, the heyday when the Obama uh, economy uh, was 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 at its best. Revenues were uh, at five percent growth, same as they are now. That's after the Obama tax increases. Uh, they were at five percent growth. Uh, mandatory spending, however, that year did go up two hundred billion dollars. Two hundred billion dollars year to year. Uh, that's more than this year. And uh, discretionary was flat, largely due to the sequestership and and some can claim the good work of the Republican Congress. So the point is, we have, without casting blame, we have a mandatory spending problem. And trying to place blame on a tax cut, OK, is truly intellectual dishonesty. Would you agree? Um, I mean, so the way that, that I would analyze it is to say, this year, um, you know, what's the tax cut as a share of, um, of GDP? One, 1.2 percent, just for this year. It's 1 percent over 10 years, but it's just this year, say 1.2, and the deficit we project this year is 4.6. So that's the, so this year as you're focusing, 1.2 percentage points out of 4.6 would be the, the part I would allocate to the December 2017 okay. tax act. But we've created millions of jobs, 7.3 million over the last three years. Uh, if you factor in approximately a $9,000 uh, at, at, at an average family tax rate, federal revenue, that's $63 billion right there. Add in what the savings is from entitlements, that's, that's well over $100 billion. And it is impossible, let, let's face it, it's impossible to measure the, for instance, the small business tax cut, where, where you give approximately a 20% tax rate cut to a small business who then adds an employee and then continues compound the following year because his business is increasing, and then with trade agreements, they're actually picking up added market share uh, um, in other nations and in other states and, and, and throughout the world um, over a five-year period. How can that possible, that new revenue that comes in be calculated, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's what has made, put America on the fast track from 1945 to 1990 versus, versus Europe, for instance. We grew our economy 40% plus where the European economies were because we were in a, a, for, in, in a more of a competitive, uh, we created a more competitive environment for our businesses. 
even though we reduced our corporate tax rates to 21%, Ireland is far less than us, 12.5%. The UK is at 19%. Wouldn't you agree that competitive tax rates are essential to the long-term growth of our economy, and we owe it to the people of America not to accumulate their money, those tax dollars, but provide it back to them so they can spend it rather than the federal government spend it for them? And we should, at the same time, focus on more fiscal responsibility when it comes to spending? Okay. Um, so uh, we, our analysis of the December 2017 Tax Act looked at the effect on the attractiveness of the U.S. for, for global investment, the, the competitiveness. And we, we, uh, our analysis said that the overall tax act, including all the international provisions and the domestic, the lower corporate rate, made the United States a more attractive uh, place for global investment. Um, so that's, you know, that is based on our analysis. Um, that's what I would, that's. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My apologies for going over my time. All right, gentlemen's time has expired. And now recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Lee, for Thank you very minutes. much. Thank you for being here, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me um, say this first of all. It, um, it, I'm glad you're here. And in looking at a lot of the uh, economic data, uh, you lay out uh, the numbers mm -hmm. and the projections. Uh, but I don't see any much reference to uh, the issue of race and gender. Mm -hmm. And the data is not disaggregated at all. And so I'm trying to unpeel this onion a little bit as it relates to uh, communities of color, African American, Latino, and Asian Pacific American, and Native communities. Uh, because it's no uh, secret that economic inequality disproportionately impacts women and communities of color. But I can't find any of the data in here as, as to the impact. Uh, so we have a couple of numbers and references I'd like to ask you about. Latino, black, and indigenous households, they each make $20,000 less than white households. Women bring home about $200 less a week than men. So I'm not sure if you've done any economic outlook uh, surveys, assessments, data collection that will impact uh, to tell us how um, the economic outlook really addresses income inequality for women and communities of color specifically and what the economic case for reducing high levels of inequality for specific populations, um, what, what that looks like. Secondly, this uh, CBO report that was issued last month, it projected that income inequality will be greater in 2021 than it was in 2016. And it shows that federal tax and transfer policies will be less effective in reducing inequality in 2021 than five years before. And so I'm wondering how the, uh, tax, the uh, 2017 uh, tax law plays a role in that. And then the final question, again, related the, to these two, is that uh, the economic, uh, well, unemployment forecast. First of all, uh, at the unemployment rate for African Americans still is double that of their white, our white counterparts. And so how do you um, lay that out in terms of uh, what that means as it relates to wage growth? No, good. Going um, forward, and how you close that gap, okay. because many, because I know this unemployment rate also reflects, uh, even though it's double that of their white, uh, of our white counterparts, mm -hmm. people of color, African Americans are working two and three and four jobs, just to be able to barely survive, mm -hmm. and I don't see any of this noted in any of these reports that you issued. Okay, no, very good. Um, uh, I'll, I'll say a few words on a, a couple of these topics. Um, and in some sense, you've put your finger on this report that this is CBO with our budget blinders on. And we focus, as you said, very narrowly. And um, I, I am the first to say that the, the budget's important. That's what we're, we're here to support the committee and the Congress. But by far, it doesn't address every uh, important issue facing the nation and the Congress by, by far. Um, so I'll, I'm the first to, to agree with you. Um, uh, on income distribution, 
we have done important work at the Congressional Budget Office. You mentioned the report um, looking at the change in the distribution from 2016 to 2021. That looks at the effect of the, the tax and transfer system uh, in affecting distribution. And the, the taxes and transfers do reduce and mitigate inequality. But what we show in that report is that our projection is that they will do less to, um, to attenuate inequality, both the transfer system and the tax system. And this is the, the characteristics of the 2017 Tax Act. Um, and as the economy improves, means-tested transfers will tend to fall away. So there's some good news that stronger growth at the bottom of the distribution means people are getting fewer benefits, but it means the transfer system is doing less. Um, and we're doing other work on distribution where I'd be happy to come and talk to you, talk to your staff about what we have in train over the, the coming year. Um, uh, we should come talk to you also about work we could do that's focused on communities of color, as you, you say. Um, we have some, on, we're working on housing, where um, affordable housing is a particular challenge. We work on healthcare. Um, we don't, I'm trying to think of what we have in the, in the pipeline that's public. I can't think of anything in particular focused on the communities you say, and that is a, it's a, it's a gap. Well, Mr. Chairman, I would like to suggest that either we have a hearing on this issue or have a meeting or something to drill down because uh, thank you for being so candid and so honest because I think we're leaving out uh, an entire, uh, there's a gap yeah. <laughs> that we need to understand and fill if we truly are going to close the racial inequality gap. And there is a huge gap based on race and income. And we can't ignore that if we really want to ensure uh, economic equality for all in our country. And I had one, just one more sentence here. Please, please go which ahead. Is, um, uh, in some sense, that's the, it's a striking thing about the economic situation today. Right? So I, I talked about the budget, but the economy is, is doing pretty well. The unemployment rate is low. And yet there are tens of millions of, of American adults, not to mention children, on the sidelines, not, uh, not employed. We know there's pro challenges of homelessness, of addiction, there's issues with opioids, mental illness. Um, there's a lot of challenges that affect the bottom of the distribution. We have not looked at that, but that is, if that would support sure. the committee, we certainly could. Yes, because a lot of those challenges, though, are directly related to uh, economic in inequality and the lack of uh, a decent wage and affordable health care and, and adequate housing. And so it's not, these, these challenges aren't separate from economic growth or economic inequality. Okay, okay. and we, we have the expertise to take this on. Great, so, wonderful. Yeah. We'll, we'll uh, follow up on that. Thank uh, you. General Lady's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Norman, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, thank you, Director uh, Swagel, for coming. You know, uh, I know in South Carolina, our, my constituents, they don't, you know, we're not, they're not worried about 10-year budgets. They're not worried about 10-year projections. They just want to fix the spending problem. Uh, we don't have an income problem. We have a spending problem. I think you would agree to that. In the private sector, when you have a problem in your particular business, whatever that is, you deal with it at that time, and it, it involves uh, cuts, and it involves a realistic look on, at where you are. Uh, you said earlier the CBO was, provides a roadmap to the policies that the House of Representatives, as it relates to a budget, comes up with. That you evaluate where we are. That's right. Um, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to, figure, to, to know that we have got a financial cliff that you have alluded to. Social Security, I think, is, by, is insolvent in 2035. Medicare in 2000, uh, Social Security in 2032. 32, that's right. Medicare 2025. That's right. Two countries, basically uh, China and Japan, own 60% of our, 41% uh, of our debt. Mm -hmm. China is not so much a friend uh, for our way of life or militarily. Uh, what is it going to take to rattle the cages of this, of, of I guess, young people? And a lot of them I see here today to put pressure on Congress to make some meaningful um, inroads into the problem we've got right now, which is spending. Um, I, and you let me just tell you, you'd alluded to it's going to take a financial crisis. Define for me what that financial crisis is and how it will 
uh, get people activated to know it affects their pocketbook. Okay, and and I, I certainly hope it doesn't take a crisis. And that's the as as I think has been said a couple times. It, that's the challenge of acting. That there's a, a problem that's decades in the making and decades in the solving and um, making uh, taking the first step. Um, when interest rates are low as they are today, the cost of not acting is pretty modest. Um, and so it might be that we, until interest rates start inflecting upward, that it, it's difficult to, to garner um, support for, uh, for the difficult decisions involved. Yeah, but the issue with it, if, if rates tick up, you're going to trigger inflation. That's, in some sense, that, those would be the dangers of higher interest rates, inflation, the sort of negative economic impacts. And it doesn't, I mean, I worry about a crisis. You know, again, not today, not, you know, not even within our 10 years, but over the, the, the oncoming decades. Um, there could be slower moving negative impacts if interest rates move up some, not to a crisis, but some inflation moves up. The fiscal space, as it's been alluded to several times, diminishes. That would have a, a slower moving, but certainly negative uh, impact on the, na the nation as well. And it could get any, it can't really get any lower. The rates are very low as, as they sit right now. And really the only, uh, the only issue we face is most likely they're going up, which is going to trigger inflation, which is going to trigger, um, it's going to affect people's pocketbooks. That's, that's right. Um, the, the challenge, I mean, it's both the, the good and the bad. I mean, it's by far the good is that the United States is still the, the, the economy that around the world people want to be in, want to invest in. People want dollar assets. We're the safe currency. Um, when there's a problem around the world, people want dollars, people want treasury bonds. And the, the train loads of people, they're not going to Cuba. They're coming to America. The right. train loads of pe people are not going to Venezuela. They're coming to America. They're coming here for a reason because it represents freedom and it represents um, a lifestyle that um, they have not seen anywhere in any other, other country. Uh, thank you for what you're doing. I hope you can concentrate on uh, uh, things that make a real difference and urge to the best of your ability for us to have a spine and, and to really have some financial accountability like we do in our small business. Thank you so much. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Horsford, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Director, for being here. Uh, the F Federal Chairman uh, Powell cited income inequality as the biggest economic challenge facing the United States in the next 10 years. And I want to build off of my colleague, uh, Congresswoman uh, Lee and, and uh, Congressman Scott's uh, questions around this. Um, According to the Brookings Institution uh, recent report, 53 million American workers, 44% of the entire workforce of our country, earn barely enough to live with a median annual income of $18,000 a year. Are you aware of that? Uh, I haven't seen that number, but um, in some sense, a reflection of the inequality in, in uh, income in our society. And so when we reference this uh, unemployment rate in your budget and economic outlook, mm -hmm. it's imperative to this point, and thank you for agreeing to work with our committee, because income inequality is a top issue that we are trying to address throughout all of our policies. And so when my colleagues on the other side prioritize tax cuts, and we're prioritizing closing income inequality for the American people, that's the choice uh, that we're trying to make in our, in our policy, and we look forward to working with you. Um, I want to ask about the tax cuts bill. The tax cuts for small businesses and middle class families, were those permanent or temporary? Um, the, the, on the personal side, essentially all of the personal provisions expire in, in 2025, and that would include the, um, the small business, the S corporations, the, the pass-through entities, at the end of 2025, those would expire. And the tax cuts for big corporations and the very wealthy, those are permanent, correct? Uh, the, the corporate uh, tax cut, that was uh, permanent. Those, the corporate tax provisions were permanent. So maybe we should refer to this as the Trump's billionaire and big corporation tax cut and not an America tax cut, because it really doesn't help the average small business owner, the average person, those 53 million Americans that I just referenced who make $18,000 a year who represent 44% of our economy. Um, 
So the issue of income inequality is very important. And another area that's very important to me personally is making sure that we are providing investments uh, for skills training, expanding our workforce, and creating job opportunities. It's gonna be real hard to move those 53 million people into better paying jobs if they don't have the skills, the workforce, the education, and the training to pursue those jobs. And we are now investing less in workforce training uh, than we have historically. Uh, another area that I believe, so do you believe that we still have room to invest in our nation's future uh, around training and workforce despite some of these economic projections? Um, that, that's, that's right, that um, right, the, the budget challenge is there, but it's not immediate, and the Congress has the ability to undertake uh, initiatives such as you've uh, you, you set out. So if we prioritize American workers, those who are struggling the most over big corporations, then maybe we can improve those economic uh, outlook for those, for those individuals that all of us represent, regardless uh -huh. of what part of the country. Let me turn to another area which you have talked about, which is uh, your report on lowering prescription drug costs. Mm -hmm. As you know, eight, uh, the House has passed H.R. 3, the Elijah E. Cummings Lowering Drug Costs Now Act. This legislation empowers the Secretary of Health and Human Services to directly negotiate to lower the price of drugs, and it requires companies to pay rebates if price increases faster than inflation. Based on CBO's analysis of HR3, how can this legislation achieve lower drug prices and reduce federal spending over the next 10 years? Uh, so as you said, it, it uh, requires the secretary to negotiate uh, with, with drug companies. We modeled that negotiation pr uh, process and found that it would, it would reduce drug prices and lead to federal savings on the order of, of $500 billion over 10 years. And then those- 500. Billion? Billion dollars, yes, sir, over, over 10 years. And then in um, HR 3, those, um, those resources are then um, uh, used to expand um, dental, vision, hearing coverage, to provide some um, money for um, uh, opioid treatment, for um, research at NIH, and, um, uh, and so on. So it's used in, in a variety of ways. So we take those savings by allowing Medicare to negotiate with drug companies, and we we invest in increased services to Medicare beneficiaries, uh, thereby shoring up uh, their care and their health care. That's, th that's um, what our estimate of HR3 shows, that's right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Those are the priorities that I'm continuing to fight for, not big corporate tax breaks that add more to our deficit and that do not improve our economic in outlook in the long term. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Crenshaw, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for being here. I'm glad we, uh, I'm gonna pick up on HR3. What else did CBO say about HR3? About, about how many fewer cures there would be because of those price controls. It's not a negotiation, let's not call it that. We know it's not. It's a formula for price controls on drug prices. So what did CBO say that would do to, to innovation? Right, so we also carefully modeled that as well using the economic research literature and showed that um, over the ensuing uh, several decades, something on the order of 30 fewer drugs would be, uh, would be produced, about so, a 10% yeah. reduction. So we can afford the drugs, but they won't exist. So it doesn't really matter if you can afford them because they won't exist. That's not a really good trade-off. So we're back at this conversation about the debt. And um, it's a good conversation to have. I'm glad we're, we're, we continue to have these kind of hearings. $23 trillion in debt, and then we come here and we argue incessantly about what is causing it, um, whether it's mandatory spending, lack of revenue, or discretionary spending. It seems to be pretty broad agreement that discretionary spending is, is going down as a share of GDP. We don't hear a whole lot of that in this, in this room. Uh, what we do hear is, is, is or, are, are two potential causes, mandatory spending and Trump's tax cuts. The tax cuts for the rich, as my colleagues call them. Well, they weren't just for the rich, of course, they were for everybody. When, when a corporation gets a tax cut, they can do things like, like contribute to the highest growth that we've seen in a long time in the lowest income workers' wages. Things like that, things like business investment. So of course, that kind of rhetoric is unhelpful and untrue. What we also found, 
uh, just by the, some graphs that we've seen today was, and, and from the CBO's own reporting, is that revenue as a share of GDP will be increasing and continue to increase uh, in line with uh, more or less what is historical averages as a share of GDP for revenue. So what is skyrocketing? It is mandatory spending, Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid and interest on the debt. And that's what we need to be having a conversation on. And that has come up, of course. And so let's, let's, let's talk about that because there seems to be some agreement. But then that agreement quickly falls away into, into disingenuous rhetoric. Every time we talk about reasonable reforms to these programs, my colleagues accuse us of cutting them. There was a colleague from Michigan earlier who just couldn't help himself. I had to talk about how we planned to cut Medicare and Medicaid. It's not true. I don't know what these proposals, what they're talking about, or Social Security. Reforms are absolutely needed. But the Democrats' plan at reform, when they, when they refer to Social Security 2100, they want to raise taxes via payroll taxes and then increase benefits to seniors. So you want to take money from millennials and Gen Z and you want to transfer that directly to people who've had their entire lives to save and build businesses. We talk a lot about some of the issues, economic issues facing this country. My generation is facing those issues with rising housing costs, things like that, that are making it more difficult for millennials to prosper than prior generations. Would, would you agree with that general assessment? Uh, I do, yes. And do you think it's economically efficient to have a wealth transfer from the young to the old? Uh, um is that the most efficient? <laughs> yeah, it's um, in some ways the, the issue of the fairness uh, is the difficult one, and you put your finger right on it with the Social Security, and that's what our analysis of the 2100 Act shows as well, that, um, uh, that the people closest to retirement would, would come off the And bench. what's the best indicator of wealth as far as immutable characteristics? Is it gender, is it race, or is it age? Ah, um, well, wealth certainly increases with age. You know, education, is tightly connected to income, which over time connects to wealth. And that, instead of this, to build wealth, we want to build skills and education. Yeah, it, it, and I'll answer it for you. Well, uh, age is by far the best okay. indicator. Like, if, if you're older than me, there's a really good chance you have more wealth, mm -hmm. right? Just from a probability standpoint. So we're never saying we want to cut seniors' benefits. That's not what we're saying, but we do have to slow the growth. And what does my generation have to give? Well, maybe I should retire later. I'm going to live longer. These are reasonable discussions to have, but taxing my generation when we're already facing things like higher housing costs and other issues, that's, that's, that is deeply immoral. It's also counterproductive when we're talking about growth. Maybe you could help me with this one. If, if we're concerned about the debt, should we do pro-growth policies or anti-growth policies? I mean, if, 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 we, if we reduced, if we implemented policies that reduced our GDP growth, do we ever have a chance of, of, of solving our debt crisis? It would make it more difficult, uh, you know, both having a low growth environment and the debt relative to GDP would, would go up if the denominator is, is smaller, that's for sure. Well, I'm out of time, but I had a lot of follow-ups. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, gentlemen's time has expired, and I recognize the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. For I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the ranking member for holding this uh, hearing, and as likewise, all of my good colleagues with their different perspectives. I'm sure my good friend from Texas is not suggesting that we wage a generational warfare. Uh, it is clear, however, that the issue of uh, the uh, discretionary, non-discretionary spending uh, is one that I have seen millennials and Generation X and others really comprehend uh, as an important contribution uh, to the actual survival of this nation. Uh, so let me just say that the President's proposed budget projects FY2020 revenues of $3.645 trillion, outlays of $4.76 trillion, leaving a deficit of $1.101 trillion. Over the last next 10 years, the President proposed, proposes budgets that would cumulatively increase the national debt by $7 trillion and does not even come close to ever balancing. America's top 10% now average more than nine times as much income as the bottom 90%. Now, I would suggest to you, uh, to the director, uh, that uh, entrepreneurial uh, millennials and others are in the bottom 90%. They're not benefiting, and they're not in the top 10% most often. Would you say that? Millennials are not in the top 10% income. Uh, Many in of them. In general, that's, that's for sure correct. In general, I know that. The nation's top 0.1% are 
are taking in over 198 times the income of the bottom 90%. Does that seem like reasonable uh, numbers that uh, you, you I, contended? I, I, uh, so I'm sorry, I, I don't have the precise numbers, but certainly that disparity is It is, it is enormously right. different right. From, from the bottom. Absolutely. And that has continued uh, under the leadership of this administration. So from my perspective, we are going the complete wrong way. That, that's, that's mine. But let, let me uh, pose some questions. I'm, I, I talk fast because I'm trying to get your answers in. Anyhow, by the Joint Economic Committee, let me show people that under President Obama, we were doing 227 jobs per month average. Then under this president, 191K jobs month per average. Good. He inherited the excellence of the work that was done by President Obama and the Democratic Congress. Unemployment rate. Uh, we came in in some bad shape. Do you remember those years? You might not have been in, but 09. Uh, you remember the debacle that we were engaged in? We were literally going on the flat earth and coming down. Obama then rose uh, or raised mm -hmm. those numbers. And, and might I just get a yes to say that I didn't write these. This is Joint mm -hmm. Economic Committee. Does that look pretty accurate? How it went up and then sort of continued? Does that look right, Mr. Director? Absolutely. That's All right. I just want you to be on the record. And of course, you can see that's Obama and then there's Trump. Mm -hmm. So the policies, fiscal policies uh, that take into consideration uh, debt and also providing for those who are in need is, is important. Medium income. Uh, we were not doing well, and then uh, we managed to keep going up, and it blue went all the way up under Obama, and then we had another president come in and take the credit. Uh, that's my words, but I just want to note that you saw the blue going up or holding steady during those years from 2010 on to 2016. Is that accurate? Uh, yes, that looks uh, accurate. We've, uh, we've seen rising incomes. Yeah. Over the past so let me find out the present situation that we're in. Uh, what is the status of Medicaid, Social Security, and Medicare? Uh, what is the status, mm -hmm. and then let me add this other question, mm -hmm. what would be the value of adding to our portfolio, building up on affordable housing, mm -hmm. building up on public housing? That's one of the elements of the millennials, doing that. And if you can, I have another question, uh, and I'm at 104, 103. Go ahead. Sure, I'll, I'll, and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be fast. Um, the, the challenges the challenges you've pointed at are the ones facing millennials and young people. Affordable housing, um, uh, in some sense, education, and ha how to get on the rising ladder. Um, housing is one that's particularly pernicious because zoning regulations, it's not a federal issue, it's a state one, but it prices people out of the market. Um, and there are some local initiatives um, that are they're trying to get at this. St. Paul, Minnesota, for example, has an initiative to, to get at this. It's, not, it's too soon to know whether it's working, but, that, but we're looking at that to say, what are the policies that will get at the challenges facing uh, younger? I would likely to say, to answer those concerns about millennials, a federal embrace dealing with affordable housing and public housing uh, would be a very important uh, asset for them. It, it, it could be. And of course, the, the particular program would, you know, would be important. As well as the fact that continuing to have tax cuts for the rich doesn't help them either. Um, uh, it's a bigger picture question, of course. Right, it, it affects the overall economy, and then it affects different people uh, differently. Let me just pose this question for the record. Uh, have you ever, the CBO was started in 1974. Yes. That's just a few short years ago. Have you ever thought of the question of uh, the African American community in particular, uh, and the long-term impact, maybe this will be your research, I'll get back with you on this, of the uh, unpaid history of slavery, wow. so that the CBO would consider a question of reparations in terms of a commission that would even study what that long-term impact is in light of the sharp disparities in the African-American community and immigrant community in particular now into the 21st century. You ever thought about that, Mr. Uh, Director? I don't think we have. I don't, you know, I don't know all of the work that's been done before me, but I'll go back and, and find out and we'll, uh, we will tell you. I will engage you on that and, and I, my word to you is that there may be a connection. Uh, with the sharp disparities that you see in the African American population, thank is you. that the, the, in, we will we'll, we'll certainly look at that. All right, thank you so very much, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. The gentlelady's time has expired, and I'll rec uh, recognize the gentlelady from Minnesota, Ms. Omar, for five minutes. Uh, thank thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, as you might have noticed, there is a lot of uh, anxiety uh, that is expressed by many of my colleagues when it comes to 
uh, the income inequality and the disparities that continue to persist um, in, in our communities and in our country. We know that over the last 50 years, income inequality has gotten significantly worse. Uh, we know that wages have um, uh, grown stagnant and the richest Americans um, are the only ones that have been able to reap the benefits um, of the economic uh, growth that we've seen in, in the country. Um, in your report uh, last month, you projected that um, income inequality will be greater in 2021 than it was in 2016. Uh, and so I wanted to see um, if you can uh, give us an idea of how do the growing um, levels of income inequality affect consumption um, and how would this affect the budget outlooks that you have? Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and what you said is, is correct about our report. We show greater inequality in 2021. Um, that has different effects on the economy and the budget. The budget is a little difficult to parse out just because the, the progressive nature of our tax code means that income at the top is taxed more than income at the bottom. So I, I can't, I just, I can't off the top of my head say what it means for the fiscal situation. And of course there's negatives, right? Inequality means um, more spending on, on transfers and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, for the economy, it, it's a challenge and it's an important long-term challenge that we know that inequality doesn't have just these short-term effects, but over time, it means a weaker economy and a weaker society. Mm. The, the children of um, you know, families at the bottom have more difficult situations and, and worse trajectories. Mm -hmm. And that, in some sense, is an intergenerational transmission of inequality and of poverty that's a, a, a key challenge for the nation. Uh, and uh, as a millennial, speaking of millennials, um, I am uh, the sponsor of um, a, a bill to cancel out student debt. Mm -hmm. um, and I recently saw that um, one of the ways that we can increase uh, income inequality by like 50% was getting rid of student debt. Um, what are other ways that we can increase, um, decrease income inequality and, and increase the ability for millennials to be, uh, to be able to have the ability to have an input in our economy? Uh, okay, um, so I would look uh, in some sense at the short term and the longer term. The short term, the, the tax and transfer system affects inequality. It, the taxes and transfer reduce inequality but as, as you pointed out in 2021, less than in, the, in 2016. Mm -hmm. so, um, so more could be done in the short term with either taxes or, or transfers. Mm -hmm. uh, over a longer horizon, the challenges are, are in some more difficult and slower. Education would be a key one. And then all the, the challenges that, that so help people use their education for their future, um, housing, transportation, childcare, um, elder care, all the things that would make it possible for people at the bottom to, to work and to, to have a rising uh, wage uh, profile. And an ability to stimulate the economy as exactly, well. Exactly. Um, it was uh, really unfortunate to see many of my colleagues using this, um, this hearing to be able to go after um, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, um, and, and to advocate for, for us to utilize our resources uh, in putting more money in, in the pockets of, of the wealthy. Um, I know that um, we have a, a national debt uh, problem, um, and if we are not being creative in the ways that we are prioritizing our resources, um, we will continue to be uh, in, in trouble. And so um, there is an opportunity for us to uh, create a priority where we are lifting people up uh, in, in order for us to avoid the kind of crises that we uh, can foresee. So thank you for being here. Thank, thank you, you for having this hearing, uh, Chairman. Mm -hmm. Gentlelady's time has expired, and now the moment we've all been waiting for, the ranking member <laughs> is recognized for 10 minutes. I have to admit, I, I forgot, you said at the beginning that you would go last, and I have to admit I forgot that until just now, so. Uh. <laughs> well, thank you. Mr. Chairman, again, for uh, having the hearing. Dr. Swagel, thank you so much for your uh, willingness to uh, 
do this work of the Congressional Budget Office, and uh, let me be the first here today to uh, point out this staff over here, these reliable people that <laughs> occupy the floor over there and the Ford Building that do such a great job, and we're just honored to have you um, in doing this work. I know you get maligned sometimes, and if people, members of Congress don't agree with whatever you produce, um, you know, you, you take all the arrows, and. But I, I, for one, and I know I speak for my chairman here, we just appreciate the work of, of the CBO. Um, as I was sitting here, it, uh, it was apparent to me that uh, you're, you're kind of like the, 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 the creamy part of the, uh, of the cookie, uh, getting squeezed by both sides. Uh, and I love Oreos. So, uh, but uh, your willingness to, to do that, a bit unfair, um, there's enough stink on this deficit and debt issue to go around this room and around the Congress and around previous Congresses and previous presidents, left and right. Uh, we have all, uh, on both sides of the aisle, failed in, in, on the Congress side in our Article I responsibility, and we continue to do that. Uh, but it's, it's not my point necessarily to sit up here and throw arrows at, at the other side. There's plenty of things that we've done over time that uh, have contributed to this problem. Uh, and, but deficit and debt has been the constant theme in this hearing today. And there's a lot of things contributing to it, uh, to include the fact that when our friends on the other side took control of the House of Representatives a little over a year ago, they... They said they were going to reinstitute PAYGO, and PAYGO has been waived now how many times, uh, Mr. I Director? I don't know, but- Let um, me help you. I signed, the, I signed the cost estimates, and I see it's- 24. Waived. Yep. 24 times. Um, and here just a moment ago in this very hearing, with deficit and debt being the central theme of what we're talking about here today, here's one of our colleagues on the other side that's talking about a bill that she has sponsored to just basically allow the taxpayers uh, to pay all this student debt. You know how much that is? It's multiple tens of billions at least, if not hundreds of billions. Uh, it's, it's a pretty sizable bubble. Yep. Would that help or hurt the deficit and the debt situation that we have today. Uh, it would make it much larger. It'd make it a lot larger, uh, exponentially larger. Uh, so, so the point of my remarks here is, is to call on the Congress uh, to do its job, and that begins with doing a budget resolution and putting the entire package on the table. Uh, it's not just discretionary spending. As I said in my opening today, in 1965, discretionary spending was about 34 percent, or about six, uh, uh, mandatory spending is about 34 percent of the federal pie. Today, it's about 70 percent, so it's double that. And that's what's squeezing all of the opportunities for this Congress to fund the, uh, the national priorities, to include national security, which I would argue is, uh, you know, it's in the Constitution, so we have to do that. Um, we can debate how much, but... Uh, it, but the, our, our ability to make, uh, uh, to fund transformative research, uh, to do all of the things that the Congress would like to do um, is dependent on us being able to solve for this whole deficit and debt issue. And uh, so mandatory spending as a percentage of GDP continues to grow higher. Discretionary spending as a percentage of GDP continues to go lower. And I don't think you need a better metric than that to explain, as old Willie Sutton said when he was robbing those banks back in the 1950s, you got to go where the money is, and the money's on the mandatory side of spending. So I, uh, I, I just want to make sure that that point is in the record. Um, and obviously, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act has been a central focus of uh, some of the arrows thrown our way here. And, and I, I'm not going to delve too deeply into that. Uh, but to say that you have to, in terms of economic productivity, you got to put a lot of things in that, in that basket to include regulatory uh, programs, uh, uh, policy issues voted on by Congress, taxes, and and on and on and on. So, uh, unfortunately, we're in a uh, we're in an extremely good position right now with the economy growing the way it is. Um, but relative to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, I, I want you to comment specifically on. Uh, 
what it has done to impact, in my judgment, positively on the uh, entitlement programs that we pay into. So can you explain very briefly um, how the creation of new jobs mm -hmm. has allowed for us to buy a little bit more time in these social safety net programs because they're the ones paying into them? Uh, yes, and, and, and we see that uh, in, in a variety of ways. I'll, I'll just, I'll start with one particular one, and that's on disability. The disability trust fund uh, a couple years ago was projected to expire expire to, uh, to run out within the next few years. And now that's been pushed back. It's outside of our uh, budget window, it's outside the 10-year window. And that's because disability claims, the, the rate has gone down, the number might be up, but the rate has gone down. It's probably a reflection of the strong economy that's drawn people back in. So in some sense, right, there's these kind of micro effects, and then of course the stronger economy leads to, to higher wages and, and um, more contributions to the various uh, programs, trust funds as well. What about uh, low-income workers? Um, so we've seen particularly strong wage growth at the bottom of the uh, distribution. Um, and then we've seen... Oh, wait, whoa, yep. wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, <laughs> I, I believe I've heard from more than one of my colleagues on the other side that it only helped the millionaires and the billionaires. Am I hearing the CBO director say that maybe the lowest quintile of workers are benefiting? We are seeing... Um, the, the strong job market, one um, particularly no, noteworthy aspect of it is at the bottom, the strong wage growth. There's different measures, but we are seeing wages rise, you know, at various times, different measures, anywhere from 4% to 5%, uh, which we haven't, you know, we, we haven't seen uh, in some time. Yeah. Well, I'll make my point, and, and, and I'm going to yield here back uh, to the chairman here in just a minute. I, I, j I just want to make uh, this, this last comment that... Um, there's a reason why we're in this fix right now, and we can blame it on taxes, we can blame it on a lot of other things. I, I, I certainly think that the metrics show that spending is, is out of control, particularly when you look at the, uh, at the revenues of the federal government being within that, like, uh, what'd you say, 30 or 40 or 50 year average, mm -hmm. um, and that spending is outside that window, on the, particularly on the mandatory side. Uh, it is it is possible maybe that we have overpromised our country to its that's, people. That's one of the challenges we face. That is something one of my predecessors, Doug Elmendorf, used to focus on as well, is that the tension between what we're willing to pay and what we ex as a society expect out of our government. And that's, that's the challenge. So most politicians don't like to raise taxes and most politi politicians don't like to cut benefits that currently accrue to certain people. But at the end of the day, when you have a trillion dollar deficit, as far as the eye can see, something's got to give. And if there is one part of that equation that seems to be growing exponentially out of control, which is now commanding 70% of all, of, of all federal spending, <coughs> mandatory spending, it, it tells me that we've got to muster the courage and the will as a Congress uh, to put those solutions on the table, have a robust debate on them, and do make the decisions today that can save these programs and future generations. And let me just add, Mr. Chairman, we, if, if the whole plan was to cut Medicare, uh, as has been um, advanced by some critics, then the best thing to do is do nothing because it gets cut on its own in about five or six short years. That's right. If the plan is to cut Social Security, then the best plan would be to do nothing because in 2032 or 2033, which is before my youngest grandson is even going to have a driver's license, the program is going to get cut on its own. The fact is Republicans and Democrats have to start behaving more like Americans and deciding what we've got to do now to solve the problems today rather than kick those, that can down the road and put it on future generations. And with that, I'll yield back my time. I thank the ranking member, and I now yield myself 10 minutes. Uh, uh, and I'd like to begin, also thank you, uh, Dr. Smigel, for your time and your responsiveness. And uh, as, as I mentioned in my opening statement, thanks again to all the great people doing the work at, important work at CBO. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to address this at a later date more extensively, but since my colleagues uh, continually bring up the fact that we have not, not passed a budget resolution, uh, 
uh, which is true. Uh, and by the way, the Republican Senate has not passed a budget resolution either and doesn't intend to. Uh, but we did pass a budget last year. We passed a two-year budget, the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2019. We headed off uh, the thread of austerity cuts that were uh, in the, in the uh, Budget Act of, of 2011. And I think we set the stage for some strategic investments in our nation's future. So, uh, you know, my question would be to those who worry about the fact that we haven't passed a budget resolution, uh, how would the world be different if we had from what it is today? And I'll, again, I'm going to address that at a, a further date. But I want to continue the discussion of mandatory spending because I take a little bit of a different perspective on it. There's, there's no question that it is the biggest driver of our deficit right now, all the, the mandatory spending categories. But we tend to forget that mandatory spending goes into the economy. Uh, in <clears throat> Medicare and Medicaid, it supports our hospitals, it pays our nurses, it pays our doctors, it pays, it pays pharmacies. Uh, it does a lot of things that uh, would have to be done in some, in some other way if we didn't, if it weren't, the money didn't come through the government. <clears throat> and in you know, we know that it's roughly 18%, all healthcare spending is roughly 18% of the economy. Uh, in my district, for instance, uh, Humana is based in my district. They are one of the biggest Medicare Advantage providers. It's about 65% of their revenue and most of their profit. They employ 12,000 people in my district. So it's not that money that's thrown away. This is money that goes into the economy. And I, I, I'm going to get to a point. But say, as some people might prescribe, and I know in in the, the president's budget and in prior uh, Republican budgets, there was a notion to cut Medicaid by 30% and so forth. If you were to cut mandatory spending by 30%, what would do, that do to the economy? Uh, right, so there'd be the, the negative impacts that you've highlighted, the, the sort of near term, you know, it's like a, a, the opposite of a Keynesian stimulus, would be taking, uh, taking support out of the economy. That would be offset to some, of, you know, some extent by lower interest rates and you know, sort of the opposite of the crowding out we might expect with um, budget deficits. But, but a large, abrupt change like that would certainly have a negative effect in the near term. Right. So when you look at the biggest problems with those mandatory programs, I, the way I look at it, people are living longer. Mm -hmm. More people are living longer because we've got the baby boomers who are now in retirement age. And the structure of the programs was established at a time when the demographic situation was much different and the employment situation was much different. So when Social Security was created, the average life expectancy was right at 62, as I recall. So on, on average, nobody uh, got their benefits. <laughs> uh, there were 13 people working for every beneficiary. Now that number is around two and dropping. Um, and the age, average life expectancy is much higher. And the tax rates were set at a time when, if you're at 65 now, uh, and you're going to uh, receive on an average 11,000 or $12,000 worth of benefits a year, healthcare benefits, that's what the average expenditure per person is, uh, you didn't pay anything near that over your working life. So uh, when we talk about reforming the, the mandatory programs, one area we can't do anything about, we're not going to have mass uh, euthanasia in the country, and we don't want to do that. So we, we're talking about the structure. That's what Simpson Bowles tried to get at some years ago, and politically that was untenable. But uh, just to put that in perspective, it's not, just so, it's not simple saying we're going to do something about mandatory spending in this country because it is an essential part of the economy and the life of many of our citizens. Um, I also want to address uh, the, the issue of the, the income growth level. And I have a question here. Mm -hmm. uh, the figures are the lower, the lower uh, quintile of the population has, has seen their incomes rise at a very high rate. Of course, they're starting from a very low rate. And I, my question is, have you been able to ascertain whether that growth had, what, what, the, uh, what component of that growth was due to tax cuts and uh, demand for versus de just demand, natural demand for labor and shortage of labor in those categories, and also the fact that a lot of jurisdictions around the country, uh, states and localities, have raised their minimum wage. Right. Right. So we have not parsed that out. We know the the overall strong economy has um, created labor shortages that, you know, in a good way, drive up wages for the benefit of workers. We can't parse out how much is the tax cut. Um, and it varies by locality as well, as does the minimum wage. So we haven't parsed out um, 
uh, how much is the increases in minimum wage and in, in, um, uh, what's going on at the bottom, I think we know that um, it's real. And so it's a strong economy is, is driving incomes at the bottom, but we can't, we just can't parse out the different factors. Have you done any work as to what uh, a, ra a raise in the national minimum wage, an increase in the national minimum wage would mean to the, to the economy and to the deficit if you raised it at, to $12 or 15? Uh, we have not, we have done um, an analysis on the, the impact on uh, employment and on poverty and things like that. And, and there's some, you know, good and bad it would, you know, bring us, you know, several million people out of poverty, probably reduce uh, employment by several million jobs. Um, you know, so some back and forth. We haven't done the kind of ma uh, dynamic or the macro analysis that you're, you're pointing at. Mm -hmm. um, it's something we've been thinking about, but, um, you know, that, that kind of dynamic analysis is very intensive in our resources and we just haven't, we haven't gotten there yet. Well, I think we're going to need to do that because eventually we're going to raise the minimum wage yeah, at the yeah, national okay. level at some point. Um, we've heard the word sustainable from both sides throughout this hearing today, and sustainable is uh, not a, a precise term. I don't think it's a precise term. Uh, we had a hearing not too long ago with four economists, and the issue of you know what's a sustainable debt level, how much does debt matter, was uh, made it clear that Nobody really knows what sustainable means, but does putting on, take your concept, <laughs> whatever it is, of sustainability, does putting our budget on a sustainable path require balancing the budget? Um, no, it doesn't. It means bringing the deficit down low enough so that the debt level doesn't continue to rise. And that, that does not require a, a balanced budget because as long as GDP is growing, we can run a deficit without increasing the debt to GDP level, which is probably what matters. That's the, the best uh, measure of our capacity. Um, two specific things that were in your report that I wanna just mention. One is that what you said you calculated the loss in corporate revenue. You've revised, revised your estimate as, as to how much corporate tax revenue uh, will be lost uh, under the, the uh, 17 Act. That's right. All right, would you tell us what that was? It's uh, about 110 billion over 10 years. Um, and that's, it's partly uh, from changes in the data that um, uh, the, the, the macroeconomic data on you know, what of our overall GDP is wages and what is corporate uh, profits was changed in a way that looks like there's more wages and less uh, profits. Profits, corporate profits are the, the, the base for the corporate tax. Um, so just knowing there's less corporate profits means our estimate of uh, future revenue will be lower. And then there's some on the international side that Mr. Doggett uh, alluded to where the, um, the guidance from the, uh, the administration, the IRS, and the Treasury, um, in some ways was more taxpayer friendly than had been anticipated in our initial uh, uh, estimates. Thanks, and, and finally, uh, you made a calculation as to what effect on the average citizen uh, tar the tariff policy of this administration, or the tariff actions, I should say, of this administration have made to their uh, disposable income? We have, yes. What was that number? So we see that as um, this year, 2020, the tariffs put in place since 2018 are costing each American family about $1,277. So this comes from higher prices, feeding into the economy, and it's the equivalent of uh, taking away $1,277. So the Chinese did not pay for the tariffs? Uh, the, the impacts are, are many, but that's the impact on the American family. Well, I thank you. I'm gonna uh, surrender a few seconds of my time, and once again, thank you for thank your, you. Uh, your candor and your uh, responsiveness and your time and your work on an ongoing basis. So unless there's any further business, this hearing stands adjourned. Okay. Thank you. Good to see you.